Hey everyone, welcome to Hobby Titans. I'm Brett, and today I'm joined by Kat. Kat, welcome back. Thank you. And we're going to be talking about capes and cloth, a topic that I know very little about, <laughs> and Kat is going to <laughs> walk all of us through uh, how to achieve some pretty awesome effects uh, on, on cloth, on, on cloth, uh, cloth parts of models. You ready to get started? Yeah, let's all do it. All right, let's do it. All right, this is the model that's on our thumbnail. And Kat, it's one of your models. Uh, do you want to talk us through what we're seeing here? Yeah, um, so this is a model by uh, Reaper. This uh, comes in like a two pack. This is like the Druid Mouseling. Um, it also comes with a little beekeeper, which was cute. Uh, but this was one of my first, one of my first competition pieces. So this, I, I think this was like my second or third or something. Um, but it was actually a piece that I found I made the most progress in, in my uh, my hobby journey. It looks amazing. Yeah, um, I got a lot of help with like advice and tips um, from like professional painters and stuff. I took it to a couple different uh, conventions and different, I guess, uh, painting competitions. Um, and he yeah. changed very much so from, from the first time <laughs> I put them in to the second time. Um, so you've actually repainted this model bef a couple times. Yeah, I I uh, did them once and uh, did not <laughs> did not like it. I liked it enough to submit it, um, but the more I stared at it in a case, the more I was like, I I'm not in love with it. Yeah. Um, okay. The base didn't change much, except for the fact that he had like an ice blast in front of him that I ripped off because uh, it just covered him. But as far as like the shading and the dimension goes, that changed a lot, and especially the cape. Yeah, and I think that like when we s started talking about doing this episode on capes, this was like the first thing you thought of. You're like, I've got this awesome mouse model. Yeah, that'd be perfect for kind of you know as a talking point in the intro. So this is great. I love it. Um, so you can see like all the amazing shading on the back of his cape. That's what we're going to be trying to replicate today. And actually, it's not even called shading. It's called glazing or wet blending. Glazing. You're yeah. going to teach me all about these terms that I'm not super familiar with. Uh, but man, this this looks amazing. Uh, I actually am super interested. I would love to see if you have photos of what you look like before you repainted him. Ooh, <laughs> probably not very good ones. Probably ones I just like quick snapshot on my phone or something. But, yeah, uh, but it'd be interesting to see the progression, you know? It would yeah. be. And I'm, I'm a little disappointed that I don't have those yeah. because, yeah, I like taking like in progress pictures to know like this is what it started off as right. and this is yeah. what it ended up as because um, a lot of my friends aren't into this. And so when I talk about it, it goes, okay, well, you know, you got to imagine that it started from bare plastic yeah. to this is what <laughs> I did. So, right. yeah, I take a lot of like in progress pics because a lot of my friends um, don't come from the, the tabletop world. Right, sure, yeah. sure. So uh, we're not going to be painting mice today, mm -hmm. as fun as that would be. <laughs> Uh, we're going to be painting some Games Workshop models. What are yes. you What are you starting with? Um, I am starting with Ephrael Stern. Ephrael um, Stern, it's, yeah. Uh, I think a sister's model. Um, yep. Is it? Yeah. Um, it. She had a really cool, like, dynamic cape, or I guess maybe like a cloak or something that was, she's jumping down and it's flowing behind her, and I thought that was really cool. And it. Yeah. It, Kind of matched the flow of yours so, right yeah. yeah so i told kat i wanted to paint the black templar marshall so this is from the new uh, black templar box and he's got just an incredible cape uh, i sort of have cape envy this guy's got you know he's actually he's got a cape and a tabard <laughs> this is this is classic superhero blunder but he can pull it off just need a strong um, breeze yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, so I, I, I get what you're saying, wanting to, to paint. So we're both going to be doing a similar paint scheme here. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to do red on the outside and black on the inside for my cape. And so I think that's why you chose the sister's model. So it's a good, 
it's a good it's a good choice there. Yeah, it was either that or a Lumineth model, mm. um, which I would have painted in the same colors yeah. anyway to try to keep things a little bit simpler. But yep. I feel like a lot of people would have come for me if I painted a Lumineth model black and red. <laughs> so I didn't do that. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, so that's our plan for today. Um, in terms of models, do you want to start to kind of describe to me again? Like I'm very new, and let's assume that like folks watching are new to the concept of glazing and wet blending. Like what what is our sort of overall ten thousand foot strategy going to be? So with glazing, glazing um, in in typical art terms is something that happens where you layer transparent layers right on top of each other. And right. a lot of times when you get really into the nitty gritty of it, it's often used as a filter to change color, to change tone, oh my gosh. to change lighting, everything like that. So glazing is a, an amazing skill set that everyone, I think, when you pick up a brush and you want to paint, you should learn, whether sure. it be for uh, canvas or for miniature painting. And glazing is essentially just taking your paints and turning them transparent. So there's a lot of there's a lot of products out there like glaze mediums. Um, there's a transpirator that I've talked about a couple times on here, um, and that essentially stretches your paint out to the point where you can see through it. Yeah. As opposed to water. I was going to say it sounds like what you're describing is what I would normally just add water. Yeah. You're saying that's different. It is different. Okay. So water and like acrylic thinner. Right. Um they thin your paint so they make the body of them thinner mm, so it makes the consistency, it yeah. yeah it actually makes it so that if you spread it out too much it starts to break yeah which you really don't want mm, with glazing. i've seen that before yeah yeah okay uh, you get like that coffee filter effect yeah. where all of your uh pigment starts to settle on the edges on the edges yeah, yeah. oh gosh all right you're uh, you're already tell selling me on this process because i even just on the black templar we did before where i was doing some uh, washes on the shoulder pads to like age in the corners with like a sepia wash in the corners of the of the cream colored shoulder mm. pads i got that i was like it was just like a full-time job just trying to like fix keep it. that yeah just fix it and keep the like bubble of water moving so that i didn't get that in, yeah oh, okay yeah so, so that's, this is what i needed yeah that's video. also why like games workshop right. if you're working with their uh shades and stuff is they tell you not to thin it with water to thin yeah. it with lamian medium because yeah. that's essentially what lamian medium is it's a glaze medium right um and it's very similar to why they tell you not to thin, thin their contrast paints with water because it's meant to be transparent it's meant to have yeah. a lot of body and where you can like kind of stretch it out like you would a balloon sure but water essentially degrades the integrity of that balloon so is contrast paint essentially just a normal paint with lots of glazing medium added to it i wish i knew yeah it there's was, some magic sauce yeah in it's more okay. it's more so like a um ink with kind of like a weird like almost jelly consistency yeah. to it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Lamian Medium is the GW product. What is, you've got AK paints here. Yep. Yeah. AK. It's just called glazing medium. Yep. Uh, a lot of, a lot of it would be just glaze medium. Okay. Um, I'm going to zoom in on that so people yeah. can see what that looks like. There's glaze medium. There's um, the transparator from MIG, which um, I really like the transparator actually comes in uh, their normal form, which if you put a lot of, on it, it turns kind of satin. Yeah. And then they have a matte version as well too, which is which is really nice because then you don't have to like constantly matte varnish right. stuff. Yeah. Um, so for the most part though, they're, they're gonna be very similar products. This is different than acrylic thinner. This is different than, yeah. you know, uh, retarder, stuff like that. Sure. So knowing the difference between the two and not like thinking, oh, this is all the same. Why wouldn't I just use water? This is why. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and then after we get the glazing, or I guess you were describing to me before the show, at some point in the middle of the glazing process, we're going to, going to add a stripe, like a, mm -hmm. a pinstripe around the base of the cape. Uh, Bryce was asking about that in chat. Yes, we are going to do a stripe along the bottom. Um, and then you, you were saying that sort of like happens in the middle of the process? Yeah, I mean, it, it hap you get your cape to a certain level of blending. Yeah. And then you go, okay, cool, I'm gonna add this stripe in. Right. Um, and then you then always wanna go back in. There's, there's, you know, uh, what's the next steps? And right. you go back in and okay. you then deepen up your shadows, you bring back up your highlights, you then put in, you know, your your 
cloth texture right. um, with some subtle, like, um, really thin okay. kind of scratches almost. But, yeah. Um, Great. Yeah. All right. Well, um, that's, yeah, so that's what we're going to be doing today. Uh, why don't we get started? Sweet. Where should we, should I, should we start, plan to start with the gray side or the red side? Um, I want to say let's start with the gray side first. Okay. So the gray side is is what will eventually be the black right. underside of yep. your coke. Yep. Um, I'm starting with and I'll you zoom know, in on you. I told you to start with a gray, um, and so we're starting with the gray because you want to have room to go up and down. Right. Um, this is probably a little bit lighter of a gray than I would necessarily start with. So actually, we're going to then go and put in your shadows. Okay. Um. Whereas I have uh, a pretty dark gray for my, my starting point here on the inside of his cloak, this Marshall's cloak. Um, so I'll start with, you're saying, the highlights? Uh, yeah, so... Or should I do the shadows first as well? I would also do some shadows as well. Okay. So we're on the same page, right? So okay. like you want to go in with like a pure black or something. Okay. Um, I've got that here. So then we can just go through... I'm just going to use all your... A is it okay if I just yeah, use all your AK definitely. stuff? I, I brought my paints, but... Um, Great. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just use these. Uh, so when out. you are painting and stuff, you don't want to glaze in every single layer because okay. that would just take forever. Um, so I'm going to heavily block in a lot of the creases. And yeah. I'm going to be very heavy with it um, because, again, we're going to then go back in and highlight and stuff. Um, so this is also going to be kind of like the underside of her cape. Um, it's weird because it like flips over. It's actually like this. Like this would be the part that you see right. on the top. Yeah, you're going to see both sides of that depending yeah. on whether you're looking at it from the front or the back. So we're not going in with a ton of glaze medium. Um, I do want to not like be extremely heavy with it. Um, because, yeah, but, I mean, with, with miniature painting, less is more, right? You can always add more. It's really hard to take away. Okay, so I'm going to try to... I'm kind of watching you here. I'm, I'm trying to basically just get kind of down in the folds, right? Yeah, so anything that goes in, that's yep. where you put your shadows. Okay. And right now I've got some pretty stark contrast, looks like you do too, between the... Uh, the two colors, yeah. The two colors, but we're going to fix that, right? Mm-hmm. That's okay for now. All right. Um, I like this. It feels scary because I'm just like painting this black stripe on the inside of my my cape, my my nice gray cape. A lot of it is is you know you just got to go in, right? You got to yeah. do it, and you got to see how it feels to you. You have to trust um, the process. Which is why like a lot of people ask me, okay, well where do I start? And I then go back with well, where do you want to begin where do you want to end up also all right um how blended do you want it to be you know because i can i can teach you the process of going through with seven different you know steps of colors but if that's not what you want to do then let's dial it back a little bit yeah uh we have one super chat that super Edie sent in thank you super Edie. hi peeps looking forward to this who doesn't love a good cape gradient I'm sure it'll be long cleared out by the time this gets read out, but any chance that's a red wall mini in the screen cap? Uh, so I don't not, think, right? yeah, I don't think Redwall makes their own miniatures, which I would be so down for. Um, that would be really <laughs> cool. Um, that's essentially kind of the things that I like to paint are our little mouselings and little humanoid animals and stuff, um, because they're cute. Uh, but yeah, Mouse Guard is is really fun it'd be really awesome if they could create like a whole line of models it would actually be really nice if they made them bigger than the little mouseling yeah um, so that i could get in with that more was details a tiny and model and yes. you know i was i don't know if any of the folks watching uh noticed this but there's actually you were you were talking about this beforehand there's actually two other miniatures it is a full on that diorama. diorama. It is a full diorama. There's a tiny yes. chicken and a tiny, what is it, a hedgehog? It's a hedgehog, Hiding yeah. in a hole. Um, that are, and those, those models are like single digit miniatures. They're like two or three millimeters, yeah. uh, single digit number of millimeters long. They're like 
itty bitty. Yeah, it's a it's a full diorama. There's multiple models on it. Um, it's not just like a single figure on like a really cool base. <laughs> yeah, and and in in your head cannon, the mouse was like protecting the yep. is is forest friends. Yeah, yeah, because I I went in pretty heavy with like the the color distinction between. Um, you know, or what? what is a live grass right. and what is being frozen over, which is why he initially had a pretty cool, like, ice blast right. in front yeah, of him. Yeah, yeah. It was essentially supposed to be like, oh, he's that's formed sweet. a shield, kind of. Right, yeah, I love it, um, I love it. But it, it took away from the model, which is, which is something that a lot of people, you know, don't super heavily focus on or, or even think about. And that was something that, that was a big learning lesson for me of, you know, how do I tell my story without taking away from the paint job that sure. I've done? Because I could, I could go crazy and, and do all this other stuff, but it essentially detracts from the hard work that I did with his cape and you know getting the staff all painted up and stuff and yeah. my, my sad attempt at OSL. Um, <laughs> it looks amazing. It, it looks was, amazing. it was my first, my first thing. And I, I, it was also another lesson of like, less is more, right? right. I, you gotta, you gotta choose. It's really subtle and it looks, things. it looks really good. Yeah. I like the, I actually really appreciate the subtlety. Yeah. Uh, Kat, I'm, I'm realizing as I'm sort of, this is literally my first time using glazing, glazing medium. Uh -huh. Um, and I'm trying some lighter application, you know, essentially adding in more glazing medium to my black paint mm -hmm. and trying some like, uh, some really, I don't know, gla heavily glazed applications. And it's, I really like it. It's like, I, I don't, I can, it's basically like what I wish, sometimes when I reach for like a null oil, I sort of wish it was this, Yeah. which is like, a thick way it's like a thick paint so it doesn't run everywhere yep. you can apply it exactly where you want it but it doesn't actually add a lot of pigment it just like you can you can just very lightly add, bring down or up the color exactly where you want it to and you can add two layers if you want it to be a little bit darker of the color mm -hmm. in this case it's black so it's like it's just it's just value it's not um, is that, am I using the right word there? Yeah. Uh, it's not the the, the hue, um, but uh, it's this is this is awesome. I am like five minutes into this process, <laughs> I'm sold. That's great. That's yeah. great. I mean, I, I I think that's a lot of the reason why uh, Zach really likes the transparator as well too. Okay. Is, it, is it gives you more flexibility in the paints that you already have. Right. Um, and adding like any mixing mediums and stuff to to the paints that you already have makes it so that you can use them in many different ways. Right. OK, well, I don't have as much uh, to add on mine because I think there's most of this is convex on this. Well, I guess there's like two or three little spots that mm -hmm. are sort of concave. But um, I'm basically at the point where I think I'm about done. I don't know, maybe I should go a little heavier with it. So I'm, I'm starting with le yeah. <laughs> less is more. I'm starting I'm starting with uh, a lighter application of it. Yeah, sweet. Um, the other thing that you can start doing as well too is the cape on the inside, the yep. cape that's going to be touching your model yep. is going to be darker than the cape that sees the light of day, Ew. right? And so you can start actually that's working awesome. on those blends as well too. I see. So put it on the model, see the parts that are sort of downward facing as opposed to upward facing mm -hmm. should get a little bit of, of glaze is what you're saying. Cool. I can do that. Sweet. This yeah. is like some artificial shadowing, right? All right, cool. Uh, so we have um, we have a thought for the day uh, that we talked about before the show, and today's question um, is today's deep thought. <laughs> what is the most intimidating part of a model to paint? And we decided to ha uh, this was our question for today because I think for a lot of people, this topic, cloaks and cloth, 
can be very intimidating. Um, and I, like, like I was saying earlier, like I've certainly never done this, um, mm -hmm. partially because of inti it's, it's intimidating, partially because, um, you know, if you're painting 2,000 points of a new army, like this can feel like, hey, I don't need to go there just yet. I'll come back to this level of yeah. detail this later. Would, this would be something that you would do on like your character models With a centerpiece. and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, this is a centerpiece model. We're both painting centerpiece models today. Uh, so very appropriate. But um, I don't know, Kat, like what, uh, you approach this from a pretty different perspective, I think, than Zachary, in the sense that you mostly focus on single model painting. Mm -hmm. what, what, is, what, what do you think your answer to this would be? Um, usually, the most intimidating part of a model for me to paint is um, something that I've never dealt with before. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, whether it be like a cape or something like that, or whether it be a new technique that I want to try out where, um, you know, oh, I, I saw, I've seen people do OSL. That seems really cool. I want to try that. Right. What do I do? And then I, I want to do it on everything. Um, <laughs> and so then I get this beautifully painted model that I'm very proud of the blends and I'm like, cool, let me just put some pink on top of it. Um, and oh, that man. was really scary. That's super me. intimidating. Yeah. yeah. The first time you're like, hey, here's my basically finished army or, or model. Yeah. And then I'm going to like take my airbrush to it and spray paint. Uh, yeah. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me change yeah. this. Yeah. So yeah. that's usually my answer. But um, in general, I would say um, probably eyes. Eyes, mm, yeah. Some folks in chat have been uh, discussing this, and lots, several votes, vo several votes for uh, for eyes and faces as well. Yeah, that's. I agree. I think. Um, do you have any thoughts? Like, have you tried eyes much? Yeah. Um, like what? with with canvas painting and stuff, that even eyes were to me the most intimidating thing, and it was mostly just because of it, the colors of eyes and stuff um, are not exactly what you would. Oh, it's expect mostly them about to color. Be. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and so they start off like a really deep red, and yeah. then you paint like a, a pale blue on top of it, and it, it it's just it's nuts to me. But um, with models and stuff it's usually like the size how do i get right. a brush in there how do i do this and so what i found was a good um i i guess like alternative to getting a brush in there were the micron like fine point markers the markers yeah yeah um I was, man i feel like with eyes it's not it's it's like mostly a technical challenge right yeah. it's like just about having a uh, small enough tool and a good enough fine motor control to apply the paint and, and like good enough vision like you need enough magnification <laughs> to be able to actually see what you're doing like and and all of that's very specialized equipment and not, not all of us necessarily have the right tools and so it's you're just trying to like make do with what you have like how much of it would you say is having the right tool for the job like if you had all the right tools could you just ace eyes I don't think so. Yeah, it's still uh, really hard. Yeah, because like I, I, I feel like most good painters, no matter what tool they're given, they can probably come out with something pretty good, <laughs> right? Um, like I was told that there's like a fun painting competition that a lot of the the professional artists have at ReaperCon, where it's like this weird like almost drinking competition, but like what? you have to. You have to do something, or they'll take they'll start to take a tool away from you Whoa. or something like that. And like, oh, we'll we'll take your your we'll take your wet palette. Then you have to make do, or you have to like do this crazy dare or something like that in order oh to gosh. get it back. And um, I feel like they should do that for the winners. Like the winners get their <laughs> tools slowly taken away from them just to even even the even playing the playing field. field? Yeah. yeah, I mean, but yeah, they're all professional painters usually, right. and I think this is just something that um, a lot of the uh, instructors like to do mm -hmm. um, 
But normally, or, or I guess not normally, but like you, you, even then you find that even though it's like this fun competition right. of let's make it weird, let's make it crazy, there's usually some pretty good stuff that comes out of it anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you, you know that like a lot of it is just, oh, it's because these guys know what they're doing. Sure, sure. Um, even if you take their brushes away from them. You must they paint with your doing. fingers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they, they, for the most part, know what they're doing, know how to apply color, know where to apply color, and that makes a big difference, yeah. I feel. That's a great answer. All right, can I give you, I'm going to give you this cape. Okay. Uh, because I would like you to look at it and give me some feedback on where I'm at. Sure. Before I give go my further? answer to that question. <laughs> yeah. And also go before I go further. All right, so what I noticed is I thought I was applying enough black paint, but I feel like after, now that it's dried a little bit, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not, it be, sort of became more transparent as it dried. Mm -hmm. uh, so the effect of, of the paint that I was applying became more subtle. Yep. Uh, which I actually really like, because you can see it better as you're working with it, but then it sort of fades in as as it dries yeah um but do you think i should should go more more intense on this no i think this is a really good starting point okay um because once you put in your highlights and once you put in your lighter colors over here yeah um and especially like right here yep. you'll start to notice more of a contrast between the two got it um and then you'll start to see um uh you'll start to see like a bigger difference of, okay, well, there's the shadow. That's obviously supposed to be shadow. I need to make that darker. Right. Um, and so a lot of a lot of painting and a lot of glazing, especially, is a push and pull of, okay, yeah. I'm now going to add in an opaque highlight because glazing in lighter colors doesn't necessarily always work out for you um, because you'll find that it starts to look kind of chalky. Oh, interesting. Um, and you don't get an even application. So maybe that was your was your plan starting with a lighter gray. Was that part of that so that you're basically only glazing darker? Um, I mean, a little pullback behind the curtain of me not being <laughs> the best yeah. picking colors all the time is I thought that gray was going to be darker when oh, I put it on. Okay. Um, uh, so, you know, there's that. Let's just say I did it on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's that's an, an interesting way to think about it. That like if you start, if you know that glazing darker is it, it ends up with a better look than than glazing lighter. Mm -hmm. You know, starting with a, a lighter base color and then glazing it glazing it down mm -hmm. might be an interesting thing to try. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, cool. So uh, shall sh sh is that what I should start with next? Yeah. Uh, so we're going to. Yeah, go in with some blocked in uh, highlights now. Okay. Um, so you have a, a choice. Yeah, should I just add some white to my black or should I pick one of these grays? Up to you. If you yeah. feel like you can mix enough in order to be able to go back to it later, then I would definitely do that. Um, or, oh, that's a good point. Um, I'm not going to do this one because that looks very similar to the gray I started with. Yeah. Just start with something. and I'm, And again, like this is like... Normally, if I was doing edge highlighting, this light gray, I would be terrified to go from this super dark gray that's on the cape mm -hmm. to this like very light gray in one step. Like, yeah. And have those two colors be adjacent. But because it's a glaze, I'm only going to get like you know half to a third of this actual pigment. So right? you're gonna you're gonna actually want to paint this opaque. So oh, you think so? Don't mix it with glaze. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. So it's so gonna be even scarier. It is gonna be scary. Yeah. Oh man. Okay. Okay. So. Yeah. We're All right. just gonna do it, right? We're we, and so I'm just gonna do the very the highlights, the edges. I'll, so, I'll watch you. Yeah. I'll watch you. Uh, uh, we have a super chat. Ajax, thank you, Ajax. Welcome back, Cat. I'm near Seattle. Can you talk about the new store and where it will be? How do you cater to both beginner and veteran gamers at stores? Sure. Yeah. Um. So. I think it's uh, our, like our, our, our new-ish store. Um, so our, our up and coming store is gonna be somewhere in um, the Washington, Seattle area. I don't mm -hmm. know necessarily if it's going to be in Seattle. 
Um, but yeah, that's that's where it will be. Um, but we. And this is Game Castle. You're yes, this is Game yeah. Castle. Yes. So yeah, we we cater to both new and veteran, um, to like tabletop gamers, in a couple different ways. Um, when it comes to like getting into a game, um, we have events and we uh, focus on events where. Um, I'll zoom in on you there while you're. Yeah. Talking. Let me see this. Let me let me first, at least before before I jump into that, show you exactly what I'm going to do. So I'm going to take okay. the edge of my brush. We're trying to have like four conversations yeah. at once. I still have to answer the question, the deep thought question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to take my edge of the brush and then I'm going to just go over these areas, right? So the ridges that are going to be coming up. The raised this. edges. Yeah. yeah, this feels like classic edge highlighting to me. For the most part, But it's yes. like kind of a fat edge highlight. Yes. So we're going to be laying it down thick enough to be able to then go over that with a glaze as well, too, because you want to be able to blend that in. Okay. So I don't want any glazing medium now. No. Because, sure? if, yeah, if you if you put glaze medium on this, you're not going to get anything out of it. it it's <laughs> you're, you're putting a lighter color on top of a darker color. It's not... And, and you're also making that lighter color transparent, you're not going right. to see it. Okay. So, yeah. Um, I'm so, trusting you, Kat. <laughs> you got to go for it, because if you mess up, at least then we can talk about how to fix your mistakes. Oh, man. That's the ultimate thing, right? Like, you just have to keep reminding yourself, uh, it's just paint. I can just paint over it. Yep. It's just paint. And, uh, like... We are talking before, talking about like stores and stuff with, uh, you know, training people on how to run different communities and how to oh, yeah. do different things. You got to make mistakes. You got to do it. You got to see what works for you, see what works for your community. So every community is different. Um, but generally speaking, we try and tackle them, you know, the same way. Um, when it comes to like new players and stuff, the first thing is is that Game Castle's like motto <laughs> is to not be a clubhouse. Like that's our that's our main thing is we want to make it so that people feel very welcome when they come into one of our stores. Yeah, what do you mean by that? Don't be a clubhouse. Uh, it's just essentially you want to treat everyone the same every single time, always. Um, yeah, have a. Uh, repeatable customer experience. Yeah, and it, it's this is the experience that you can expect to get out of this. Whether or not you're in the club. Whether or not <laughs> I've seen you yeah. one time versus 50 times. And that doesn't mean like, let me introduce myself to you every single time you come in. Um, or let me go through my whole entire spiel, even though I've seen you like yesterday you know yeah. but it's it's a it's a sense of friendliness that you expect and come to f learn to expect from a game store rather than a clubhouse which is if you're not a member if i don't know you yeah then you're like, treated differently than if you're like a regular yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. and that that's a big thing um especially for you know girls in the game tabletop industry i find oh, yeah. that if i walk sure, into sure. a friendly local game store you know i'm i'm almost expecting to be ignored mm. so that's that's you know. awesome that you know i i certainly have never experienced what it's like to be a female in the gaming space but um that seems like a great a great thing to work towards yeah yeah so when it comes to new people it's like okay you know we're going to then determine where you're at with this. Whether whether or not your interests lie in, I just want to pick up some Pokemon cards versus yeah. I want to pick up a whole brand new army of, <laughs> uh, you know, 40K, right? Let's see where you're at. I'm going to ask you some questions, see where you're, where you're going. What do you know? You know, do you already have a gaming group? Let's, if you don't, let's, uh, you know, team you up with one if I have one in the area or awesome. let's make sure, you know, you feel like you have something to do every single time you come into the store. Yeah. Versus like our veteran players, it's, 
okay, cool. Well, you know where everything is. We keep basically right. everything most of the same. Um, you have a level of expectation again when you walk into a, a game castle. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, I know where the terrain is. I know where this is. I know where that is. They cater to my community in right. this way. Yeah, they're probably coming in for a purpose to pick up a thing or mm -hmm. to you know meet somebody or to buy something and they know they would know what they want and where to go to get it right they're veterans right yeah and it, and you know oh, okay cool it's it's we try to accompany like the cheers mentality of, right. like, oh, yeah. we're going to get to know you you're part of our community um we're friends and i'm going to talk to you like we're friends but like there's always that there's always that level of like I'm still going to be professional. Right, I, right. You know, oh, yeah. so. That's great. That's uh, something that That's we. That's really refreshing. Yeah, heavily focus on. And um, so it. a lot of our events have, you know, we have big tournaments for, you know, the more veteran players who want to then do that. Or you can come in any other day of the week where it's like, hey, can you talk to me? I want to know where to get started. I want to know what this is yeah, about. So, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, th thank you, Ajax, for the question. And thank you, Kat, for the great answer. Yeah. Um, Matt Baker, before we get to your question, uh, I think I am about good with my blocking in of the, well, I guess let me ask you. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'll hand this back to you that we can all see what I'm talking about. But this is kind of where I ended up. Uh, is that not enough? Should I do more than that? I would do more. More, okay, yeah. so wider lines? Yeah, definitely. Okay, I was thinking I'd make the lines wider with the glazing and I wanted to do too little rather than too much to start, but. Yeah, okay. definitely do more. Cause you can always glaze your darker gray and your black right back on top of this. Back and on that, top of, and oh, got it, okay. That edge a little bit more. So, you know, what what I'm doing here is like I'm feathering in the colors. Yeah. And so I'm just doing light little taps here. I'm not trying to make a hard edge. Okay. Um, and also you can see how thin my paint is as well too. Um, I'm not trying to make a hard edge because then hard edges are a little bit harder to right. blend into stuff. So okay. I'm just tapping. At things, and if I want a you know solid line, then I'm pushing a little bit harder. But for the most part, I'm just feathering in. Okay, but you're still not using glazing medium, right? Ooh, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, uh, and and I guess like my goal with this cape is for it to read mostly black. And I'm still I'm asking you these questions because I'm terrified that I'm putting too much <laughs> light gray on this thing. Yeah, no, you can is always that... go back over. Okay. And see, the thing is, is that a lot of a lot of this. Also, like, it ties back into something that you're probably very familiar with, which is Zenithal painting. And so right. Zenithal is very helpful with, you know, knowing the light and the darks of what you're painting. Mm -hmm. And then essentially glazing is just putting like a clear, a clear something on top of that or, or a transparent whatever right. color you want on top of that. And um, glazing on top of Zenithal is actually amazing um mm. it makes your glazing process so much faster um because you're not trying to like pick and choose very 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 carefully where you're putting your glazing right. where you're putting your opaque colors because you already have that fade between black and white and you're just putting your colors on top of it essentially so that's a good way of looking at it is if you had zenithal this cape where would the white be yep yeah, that's that's a good way of thinking about it. I think I was sort of intuitively thinking about it that way, but I would not, if you had asked me, I would not have described it using those words. But that's a great, yeah, that's a great way of thinking about it. I Sweet. like that. Okay, I made making giant, super wide, fat, light gray bands, um, and I'm I don't know. I'm, I'm trusting the process, Kat. <laughs> Okay, uh, so what is the scariest part of painting a miniature for me? Um, so I started by thinking, what are the parts I'm very comfortable with? And I think I'm super comfortable with painting like armor plates. Uh, I'm starting to get comfortable with sort of airbrush, um, adding sort of variation to hard flat surfaces via airbrush. Again, my primary army is towel, so mm -hmm. I, I paint a lot of armor plates. 
A lot of broad surfaces. A lot of broad surfaces, yeah. flat surfaces. I'm totally fine with edge highlighting and panel lighting because, again, I do a lot of that stuff. Uh, gems, totally fine with that. Um, and so I think, like, and, and like weirdly flesh I'm sort of okay with. I don't okay. do a great job of it, but I feel like organic stuff, and actually human flesh is kind of intimidating to me, but like alien flesh is fine because again, it's alien. It can look like whatever it wants. Right. It's, it's art. <laughs> like my tyranids can just be like weirdly colored. Like I don't have to try to color match anything or like as match any sort of established norms. Um, towels the same way, like their skin can be who knows what color their skin is? Okay. Um, so I think, and, and, and I typically sort of lean into the rule of cool for eyes a little bit. I typically don't do like eyeballs. I'll do like just black eyes or red eyes or, you know, whatever sort of sci-fi energy yeah. eye glowing things. And I'll do a little bit of almost gem effect or like fading towards a bright center for that your, eye. Your white dot, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. uh, but, but I, I typically won't try to do like, here's an iris and here's a pupil on, on my eyeballs, because mm -hmm. that just, A, feels crazy to me, but also um, I tend not to look I tend to look at it's my models from three yeah. feet away. Yeah, of, exactly. Yeah. You're not going to see it anyway. Right. So, yeah. I mean, I, I do prefer putting like a, a cool mask on something just right. because that's something I can see when I'm looking at it from the tabletop. I'm not going to see, you know, what color eyes my model has. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, I know we didn't talk about this beforehand, but I, I'm actually going to say capes are the like hardest sort of scariest thing for me. And you can see like I'm already like asking you every five minutes like, hey, is this am too I much? Doing this right? is yeah. this, am I doing it wrong? Is this too much? Am I doing it is it too little? <laughs> uh, yeah, because I think I think this is man, I'm uh, I'm terrified right now. Everyone. Well that's good. That's good. You should you should always be scared. We're addressing when you're, our when fears you're doing... today. This is like this therapy right now. Sweet. Yeah. Well I'm I'm happy to uh, you know walk you through a terrifying moment. Yeah, um, I'm glad you're here with me, Cap. Because I'm very much like, <laughs> cool, just jump off the edge. Yeah, um, yeah. You know what the other thing I think that like exacerbates my fear about this is I am the kind of person who I'm like, if I know how to paint something, mm -hmm. I will not have to do it twice. Like the idea of repainting something, it feels like wasted effort. It feels like, oh, I'm like, I did it wrong, so I have to redo it. And I see. I, that time was wasted. And then, like, I think it's a bit of a paradigm shift that, like, oh, I just need to instead think of this as, oh, I learned some things. Like, you learn more when you fail than when you succeed. Yep. So, like, uh, I need to instead think of it as, oh, yeah, I, like, because I failed, I learned more. Um, and and view it not as, like, time wasted, but as, as time spent learning. Yeah, uh, exactly. And I think I would be more okay with taking on challenges like this, but. And I, I very much um, just in, in life and in model painting and stuff, um, I'm like, oh, I don't know how to do this. Well, I'm going to do this. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to push myself to do it and I'm going to just go for it. Right. And I do have times where I'm like, oh, I'm scared of messing this up. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's a plastic figure, you know, it's, it's not really going to like ruin everything and usually if i make a mistake and if i mess something up and i'm like okay this sucks i've learned from it and right. at least there's that hey uh have you ever taken one of those um uh uh harry potter house hogwarts house tests i have yeah what what house do you typically uh end up in put the, in by the sorting the hat best house yeah in Harry Potter, which is uh, really great. It's uh, Slytherin. Mm -hmm. um, that's my house. Okay. And I, I cool. like it a lot. <laughs> uh, snakes are my favorite, this so was it's talking, very fitting. We were, there was, there was this, this conversation happened earlier today. Okay. Um, uh, and it has been happening this week around the studio. Um, I was thinking, you know, that, that bravery to like uh, sort of oh, tackle tackle things that are scary to you. Uh -huh. uh, but like Gryffindor and Slytherin are like two sides of the same coin, yes. right? Like yes. Slytherin's very ambitious. Gryffindor is very sort of idealistic and do-goody. 
Um, but there's a fearlessness that is, you know, present in both of those houses. Yeah, it's it's the ambition yeah. that puts me right. over, right? Yeah. It's yeah. it's the I want to do more. I want to be greater. Right. I want to that's, excel, and I want to succeed awesome, in man. this. Is the the bravery in, in me pushing and, and jumping off that edge yeah. of that it's I know this is gonna make me better. Yep. So I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. Yeah. That's that's my motivation. It's not like, oh this is scary and I'm gonna try and overcome it. It's I'm this is gonna make me better. Right. I'm gonna do it. Which is right. why I also I like competition painting yeah, as well too. Sure, sure, so sure. yeah. Okay. I'm Where gonna at? So let me let me let me put this in front of you. So I made it fatter. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm still waiting for it to, so I haven't done any blending. It's still, I've tried a little bit of feathering, like yeah, you mentioned. Yeah, I saw it, yeah. Um, and they're fatter now. Yep. I don't know, what do you think? Yeah. Fatter still? No, no, I think this is great. Um, okay, can I start glazing? Man, those hard edges are like giving me all sorts of <laughs> 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 Yeah, uh, if you want to go back to glazing, you go back to glazing. Um, so what, what you're going to do then is you're going to do br wide strokes, right? Yeah. You're going to put a lot more glaze medium in than paint. So you're okay. going to do, you know, maybe like two part glaze medium with one part paint. Yeah. Um, and if your, you take your glaze medium and you mix your glaze medium and then you know, I, I usually try and like mix a little bit of water because it water makes too. it, it flows a little bit better. Yeah. Um, and you know, you touch it to, you touch it to your, your napkin here. Right. And you, you get rid of some of the, I'm going to get rid of some of the moisture. Some of the moisture. Yeah. I'm going to form my brush back up and I'm going to paint my thumbnail. And if you barely see anything, Got it. that's a good glaze. Okay. And that's what I'm going for with this light gray. That is glaze. what you're going for when you're going to go and, and glaze in your, your black okay. again. Wait, so I'm going to go on the black. I see. Okay. Yeah. This, Does I that think, make more sense? Yeah. yeah. I think this is where I, 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 why I had a lot of anxiety about the super wide mm -hmm. light grays. Because mm -hmm. we're not going to be glazing light gray onto the, no. onto the black. We're going to be glazing black onto, onto the, light gray. the wide light gray line. Mm -hmm. Okay, it all makes sense now. Okay. I feel much less nervous about this. Sweet. I'm actually probably going to make the black, the light gray even wider. Okay. You think that's okay? Yeah. I mean, if you you if you feather it in, yeah, yeah. Uh, with like a, a like a kind of thinned out gray. Yeah. Um, because if you make it too wide, right. And you're trying to cover it with like a million layers of transparent paint, it's just yeah. gonna take forever. You can do it, right? Uh, right. Which is why like glazing and when you're blending stuff. Um, Take all the time in the world, right? Yeah. If you if you are scared to do something, then put a thin layer on. If you go, okay, cool, that's not enough. Cool. That's not enough contrast. Put another thin layer on. It's just going to take you longer. Yeah. That's basically it. Yeah, I think this glazing. It, I'm gonna once I once I get the hang of it at the end of tonight. I think it's going to be one of my new favorite techniques. Because like you said, like you can just add a little bit more. Oh, cool. Like brought it up a little bit. Nope, not quite there yet. A little bit more. Okay, not quite there yet. A little bit more. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Matt Baker. Uh, good evening. I want to focus on making the tactical silk that the Tao wear feel like a unique material on the table. Silky, prismatic, and cool. What products and or techniques would you recommend? So are you familiar with the model or the tactical silk that he's referring to? Uh, no, but... Um... Okay, I've got one right over here. <laughs> oh, sweet. Hold, please. Um, I can do... All right. So I'll just grab... Uh, this is the, one of the models that we did last week from mm -hmm. the Chow Nath box. So this is a Tau Pathfinder. Uh, and he's got these, these pants. Um, okay. Here, I'll zoom in on you. So he's got these pants uh, that are sort of like hammer pants. They're like loose, baggy cloth. Mm -hmm. um, and these are like a scout unit, so they're meant to be sort of fast, moving lightly with uh, providing intel to the to the rest of the force. So they're like they're like a recon unit, yeah. Um, and so that's what he's talking about. And they have this they have this cloth, um, and he it sounds like he's asking for a unique way to make them look different. Different, yeah. yeah. Silky, prismatic, and cool. What products or techniques would you recommend? 
So there's a couple different ways. Depends on how you want to go about it. If you don't mind using metallics, um, you can always use a uh, like color changing metallic. Yeah. You know, Turbo Dork. I think Vallejo makes them as well too. My favorite ones are from Splash Paints because they're um, they're lockers. Yeah. Um, but you know, those those are definitely a way that you could go about it. It's just you know you got to have an airbrush in order to be able to put them down nicely. Oh really? Um, hmm. Okay. Um, and the best thing that I can recommend when you are doing any sort of metallic, but like, you know, uh, especially prismatic metallics, start with a glossy black surface. Um, oh, interesting. Okay. Because the metallic flakes in metallics, um, when you're putting them onto a matte surface, and matte surface is the way that the reason why they're matte is because yeah. they have a lot of texture to them and light when you know, it's bouncing off of it, yeah. it's bouncing in another direction. And so you don't get that, you know, uh, glare back. Um, and the reason why you want to put it on gloss is because it gives you that smooth surface. And so when your metallic flakes are laying down, they're very, very, very flat. And right. so they almost kind of like mesh together and they form, yeah. you know, I, that, that's, that change. That's better. interesting. Yeah. Because the difference between gloss and matte, it's not like, it's actually a, like if you were to look at it under a microscope, mm -hmm. the surface of a matte finish is very rough. Yep. And the surface of a gloss finish is very smooth. Yep. And so, yeah, when those flakes lay on a matte surface, you can imagine them sort of lying every which way. And so I guess the inverse of that could be true too. If you wanted to sort of create a glittery, a glittery look, look yep. you know, you could paint a metallic over a matte varnish or a matte paint to achieve that look. That's, oh man, I never even thought about that. Yeah, so if you really, really cool. want that like super sparkly metallic look, yep. then yeah, do, do it over a uh, matte finish. If you want your color change to look like it's changing colors, do it over a gloss uh, finish. And you can do it over a gloss white. You just don't yeah. get, you don't get the, um, as good of a, like a color payoff right. because most metallic paints are actually very transparent. I know, I've struggled with that. Um, and I think a lot of it, getting a good, nice metallic paint that, and in the end, it just, I think, ends up mostly being about what you're painting it over. Mm -hmm. And you can achieve very different results with metallics depending on whether you're painting over a black, you know, light color or a dark color or a matte, color, matte finish or a gloss finish is what we're talking about now, but yeah. Yeah, so you can do that. You can just do um, like a, a color changing metallic, I think would be really awesome. If you don't want to do that, or if you don't have an airbrush, um, what you can do is actually very much tied into what we're doing is um, there's a really cool technique that you can get where you put a color in the shadow and then almost you know, highlight straight up to a, like a bright mm. white. And so what you're going to be doing in is, is glazing in that color in the, in the in creases in the folds and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So that way when you turn and, you know, you hold the model every which way, it's almost, it almost looks like it's color changing. It almost looks like that's what's going on. Um, and so a really cool one to do is like a light sky blue with a kind of bone white. Um, and so that yellow and that blue really oh, wow. contrast with each other. Mm -hmm. But because you're you're fading it in so nicely, it almost looks like they're like melting into each other. And so that one's that really cool. cool. I like that a lot. Um, and so it, it, there's, there's different techniques you can do. Um, but I think picking like a really cool, just different color um, and then having that highlighted up to like a like a bone white or even like a just a stark right. titanium white hmm. um but as you turn the model and as you know you put it on the table and you're it, you know all of your different models are facing different ways you're getting all these different colors that are reading off of right. them so there's that um you could also go um almost like watercolor with fading and stuff like that of, okay, each and every single different angle is going to be a different color. Yeah. That seems very complicated to do. I don't know how many dudes you can run 
of that in a model? <laughs> uh, it's a minimum squad of five and max of ten. You can bring three squads. They're not great in the game right now. So I okay. Think and it's it's mostly a pathfinder, or it's mostly a, a kill, kill team, team thing. Unit. Okay. Uh, but in kill team, you can have twelve. So yeah, it's somewhere between probably five and ten is probably how many you'd see. Yeah. So that's a lot it's to a lot. do yeah. to do to you know that many models. Um, right. But you know you can you can use the techniques that we're we're doing here, and so it doesn't always have to be black and gray. It could be, you know, blue and white. It can be blue and yellow. Right. It can be something, something. You know, you have your lighter color, and that's going to be what you're painting and opaquely. Yep. And then you have your darker color, much like with my my mouse wing. Yeah. It, uh, the top of the cloak is like a lilac purple, and yeah. then it fades down into like a really deep blue, um, with kind of like a mint pinstripe on the bottom. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I want to go back and try some of this stuff that you're mentioning mm. on this guy. So we did. We painted these last week, Adrian and I did the Chalnath box, and, and I did like, I did some, uh, some non oil on the recesses, like a, like a plebe. Mm -hmm. I felt uh, especially proud of myself, but after, <laughs> after like seeing the results of this glazing medium, I'm like definitely gonna go back and um, redo some of that shading uh, and try to uh, up my game a little bit with uh, with these pathfinders. I feel like Kill Team is like the perfect opportunity to take a small number of models and just you know, do if, them up. Yeah, if you're used to painting 50, 60 models at a stretch, like having the opportunity to take five and just <laughs> go all out on <laughs> and them go is, crazy is really with them? kind of freeing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, would, I mean, five to me is still, it's a, still lot, a lot. But, um, yeah, I know. I, I hear yeah. you. Know, I think that that's really great. I think what you what you said there is something that should always happen every time you you learn something new, right? You then you go, okay, well, how do I apply this to something else <clears throat> instead of yeah, it yeah. being totally just a one off thing? Right. All right, I have a question for you. So I the base color of my cloak is gray, mm -hmm. is a dark gray. Um, I have been glazing with the black that I used to put in the recesses. Should I be glazing now with the with the gray rather than the black? Because that's the color I'm trying to blend this light gray into. Uh, it doesn't really matter with glazing I, because... I want to try it. Yeah, I mean, you could definitely. If, if you, you are curious try. about something, I yeah. say go for it. All right, cool. Um, but really what it, what it, ultimately when it comes down to it, right, um, when it comes to glazing, you can essentially just have two colors and how transparent you make them, you are right. using the transparency to blend them into each other. Yep. Another thing to keep in mind when it comes to like brush control and stuff is where you pick your brush up from, that is going to leave the biggest deposit. Yes, I've been noticing that and have had to go back and like brush the other direction yeah. a couple so, of times. Yeah, I, I was just doing that right now and, and subconsciously I was like, oh, I should talk about this. So yeah, where yeah. when you pick your brush up, that is going to leave the most amount of pigment. Right. And so when you're glazing in your darker colors, you kind of start from the lighter and, and yeah. then go back down yeah. into the, the darker end. Because when you pick your brush up, you're just picking it up into that color. Yeah. And so it's leaving, you know, the most amount of pigment there. And so it doesn't really matter. That's a really good point. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. I had sort of subconsciously been realizing that, but I actually hadn't uh, made any changes to my behavior. And so I wasn't, I was just like making the same mistake over and over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> Always, always, always smart. Is that the definition of insanity? Yeah, doing the same thing over and over again. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, cool. Yeah. Uh, this is this is very awesome. I'm really enjoying this. Um, I feel like I could just. This is also. There's also sort of like a weird zen about this. Mm -hmm. Like I feel like I could. Put on some music or have a video on in the background and just do this for an entire evening like and just three hours would go by and i'd be like wow where'd, where'd that time go that was an entire entire evening just disappeared <laughs> i mean that's good that's good you're no longer scared um do you find yourself like dotting more with your brush or here let me zoom in on you 
um, or, or sort of wiping your brush? Uh, it depends on what I'm doing. Like, uh, if I'm just trying to get, like, you know, peaks of stuff, then I'm just tapping my brush onto it, right? It, it also gives you, like, a really cool texture as well when you just put it in some places and then maybe leave out some others because we're painting cloth. It has, like, a oh, yeah. texture onto it. So. Yeah, I was getting, I was kind of obsessed with trying to get a smooth look and then... You're just saying that, as I'm now like, no, I'm not going to worry about that. You're exactly right. This is cloth. It's got, it's got fibers. It's got little microfolds. It's got all that stuff, you know? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so how are you looking oh my, so far? This is great. Um, no, I, I feel good about it. Um, I've, I've done a couple different like approaches to this as I've gone along. And so just again, sort of trying different patterns for, for how I manipulate the brush and like what colors I use and stuff like that. And so I think I'm gonna go back over the ones that I was less happy with and um, re redo some of these. Uh, oh, uh, Megan says my Microphone is scratching. Okay, let me fix that. Thank you, Mag. <laughs> okay. So, Hopefully that helps. Yeah, a, a lot of a lot of glazing and stuff is going back and forth, but also trying to be careful not to touch places that are still wet. Um, I just did, so you know, instead yeah. of trying to mess with it some more, um, because I'm trying, I'm trying to like get it done. You got to stop, and right. then, you know maybe maybe clean off your brush, load it back up again, and hopefully when you come back to it, it's it's dry. Um, is there anything else that you found that you can use glaze medium for other than uh, you know this process that we're doing right now? Oh, everything, everything. Like when I when I thin my paints yeah. um, for to put through like my airbrush, even right. though I'm trying to. Um, spray it opaquely and, and get an opaque coverage, I'm putting a little bit of transparator into it. I'm putting really? a little bit of glaze medium into it because okay. it keeps your paints like bonded together. Right, okay. Um, and so I I like that a lot. Um, and yeah, glaze medium shouldn't just be like, oh, I'm glazing, let me use glaze medium. If right. you know you find that you like the outcome that it gives to the body of your paints and the way that it spreads across your mini, then use it. Uh, it does, it changes your paints. It changes the way that they flow. Right. Uh, it makes them silkier. And I, I feel like that's that's what a lot of people really like about Vallejo paints is mm. because they're very silky. Um, and so, you know, if, if that's something that you like when you are hand brushing, then Yeah, use I feel it. like this would be an interesting way to do like um, weapon glow effects. Mm -hmm if you didn't have an airbrush mm -hmm. uh, or I don't know, have, do, have you seen people do OSL with uh, glaze, glaze medium with pinks or yellows or something? Yeah, I mean, it, it go, going back to um, the Xenithal um, example that I gave earlier is that yeah. that's a really easy way to do OSL is, is you paint it in white, you paint in what you want to be the bright color, yep. you do it in black and white first, and then you just glaze your colors on top of it. Yep. Um, and that's that's a really quick OSL. Um, I've since gotten better than my mouse. A, a lot of what people shy away from when it comes to OSL, when it comes to learning something new, is that they go very small and they go, I'm scared, I don't want to do this, I don't want to mess it up. But if you don't do enough then it doesn't look like interesting yeah. what you're trying to go for it doesn't sell your idea right it it's it's you i mean going back to the quote it's you not it's you trying to focus on what you see and not yeah. you know ma what making other people see stuff so yeah um and okay. that's that's a big one yeah where are you at 
Uh, I've gotten to the point where it's very wet and I don't want to touch it you anymore. You don't want to touch it. Yeah, uh, so I'm going to let it dry a little bit. It's, I think, honestly, we can probably flip over and work on the reds. Work a on the bit. red yeah. for a little bit. It's Yeah, it's interesting. Why don't I, I'll give this to you. You can. Sure. I'm at the same boat. So you, it's good to have like three or four different folds to work on. So you can work on one, wait for that to dry. And then go back to the other. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you can see here, like you can still see your feathering underneath yeah. it. So I would go back in and do one more glaze, right? Yep. But I would wait for it to dry because yep. it is it is still pretty wet. Um, but it, it's stuff like that of like, I can see it when it's wet, but I don't know what it's going to look like when it's dry. Right. Yeah, we talked about that earlier. It does change. It does change a little bit. Yeah. And glaze medium makes your paints kind of glossy satin. Mm. So that's another thing as well, too. If you find it hard to see your blend yeah. when it's glossy, just quick matte varnish over it. And then, you know, you can see it without the light reflecting back at you and affecting the way that you're seeing your blends yeah. and stuff. So... Yeah, no, but it looks good. Like, you have dimension to your cape now. I can see your gray. Right. Um, I would probably go back in and just do, you know, a solid, like, line right here. Uh -huh. And then dot it in a little bit, like, okay. feather it in a little bit. Sure. Um, but, again, yeah, it's pretty wet. So I would just do that when it when it dries a little bit more. But we can always turn it over and work on the right side. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So, um why don't, yeah, what are, we're going to do red on the back, right? Mm. That's our plan. Uh, what are, so this is a pretty dark red. Um, and we're going to add, are we going to do a similar thing? We're going to add black in the, in the recesses and then a lighter red and then, and then add black. I wouldn't go for black. Okay. But um, a darker red than yeah. we've got base coated. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we'll go for my favorite color, which is black red, <laughs> which is what I've base coated this in. I got it. Okay. Um, so I'm probably going to go back up with highlights and yeah. then go back with um, okay. black red. So you can put your shadows in. Yeah. I'll put my highlights in a little bit and start working up my color. Sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so. What color are you going to use for your highlights? Uh, fully highlight, we're going to do this ice yellow. Oh my gosh, um, wow. <laughs> Here, I'll, I'll zoom in so people can you know, see that. So it goes, it goes from this black this black red. We're going to go, hopefully, maybe we'll see, all the way up to this ice yellow. I yeah. might mix this ice yellow in with um, some dirty yellow and some scarlet. Um, I like the... I like the color that dirty yellow is i just don't like how strong it is mm -hmm. um so i might mix these two maybe all three of these to go all the way up to our highlights um, some nice yeah we'll do, yeah. do some wet get value out of our wet palette um and then what i'm going to go in with right now is i might actually go in with this matte red and it's m-a-t-t -T. um so it's has a name um <laughs> Oh, because there's no E at the end? Yeah, which I, which I thought was uh I wonder unique. if that was a typo. I don't know. Yeah, I was uh, making a list of paints that um, our instructors want for the LVO. Right. And one of them was matte red. I'm like, oh, this is a typo. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. So, yeah. Um, I'm going to go in with some matte red. Oh, no, I need to shake it more. Kat, I'm not sure that this... Um, so, I... My base color was War Bear's red. I'm mm -hmm. not sure that it's dark enough. That yeah, that black red is black okay. red is very similar color. Okay. I think I think it might just be yeah too similar. I mean, you can mix in. Should some, I mix in some black? Some black, definitely. Okay, I've got some black here. I'll just mix in some black. Cool. Uh, oh man, a little too much black. No, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Because it's a glaze, right? Yeah, you can always go back in and do more. You can always go back in and do more. And that's always something that you can do. This is like what wet palettes were made for. I've yes. only ever really used wet palettes for keeping my paint hydrated while I was uh, while I was painting, you know, something normally. Yeah. Uh, never used it for, I think, its intended purpose, which is... This kind of stuff. Yeah, and that's initially what I thought wet palettes were for. Um, and then I really started getting uh, more life out of them. Because when I was doing canvas yeah. paintings, I was using, like, really thick 
acrylics and stuff where I was mushing paints together in order to get a blend Got it. Um, instead of, you know, glazing over them and, and stuff. And so it was different. It was it was unique. Uh, we were talking earlier about uh, different wet palettes that we've tried and I've tried a lot kind of, of them. tried them all yeah, yeah. i've, I've uh, gone around and you know wanted to see what worked best for me what i liked what i didn't like and especially like what if i didn't like it why didn't i like it right and that was a big thing what, for me what what palette are you using today i'll i'll uh let's see i can show do this view there yeah. we go this is the uh the studio extra large uh um from everlasting, Redgrass, right? everlasting wet palette from from Redgrass. This is where their newest, their newest um, wet palette. Ooh! And uh, they are one of our sponsors for the LVO painting program, and so they sent us like sixty of them. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, everyone who signs up for the VIP classes for the Las Vegas Open gets one for free. Um, well, not for free. I mean, it's included. In, As in, part of the... Yeah. Yeah. So um, they were they were very, very, very nice about it because I think that these just came off of their Kickstarter. Right. Um, and so that was really cool to uh, come to a realization of, of, like, I thought they had already had them out, and then I'm like, oh, wait, no, these aren't out yet. Yeah, this is these the are really cool. Gen 2 of their... Their yeah. product, which is in being being fulfilled. Yeah, I mean, as opposed to... I don't know if they've shipped it yet, but... Um, I, I think they are currently being fulfilled. Right. Either that or they've just gotten fulfilled. Yeah. As opposed to yours, which is right. the, the normal one, size version. one. So you can see... Well, even this difference. one came in an, in an extra large size, mm -hmm. but it didn't have like some of the f some of the features of that. Oh, the better ceiling one. and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, this is their, their newest cool. um, one in the, in the big well, one. I'm... I'm a little bit jelly. <laughs> uh, Zach and I both have that that wet palette on the way. We've we both backed their Kickstarter, I believe. I believe Zach did. I asked him the day after. I was like, "Hey, did you back that Kickstarter?" He's like, "I don't remember." <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, um, I think they they are either currently being fulfilled or they're going to be fulfilled soon. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, a little sneak peek, little sneak preview. But yeah, the guys at Red Gas Games are amazing they're super nice they're you know painters themselves and so they come out with great quality products um i prefer like a, a bigger wet palette because i do a lot of blending yep. and i do a lot of mixing on my palette um and so i need a lot of room to be able to spread out and right. stuff. um i the first time i i loaded this up and started using it again because i really only just used it to keep my paint hydrated while i was brush painting mm -hmm. i would it would take me a month before I had to change the piece of paper on it mm -hmm. because I would just put a little dot of paint on it, use it, and then cover it, and then the next day open it, and you go back to using the same dot of paint because it was still, Fresh, it was still yep. fine. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, oh, this is great. I'm like saving so much paint. I'm not like you it's know not wasting a lot out. of paint. Yeah. It's not drying out. Um, but it also meant that like I just never went through uh, because I wasn't doing any wet blending. I wasn't like spreading out multiple paints and like conjoining them, mm -hmm. their puddles. But yeah, this this glazing is like, I can see how if you get into blending and glazing, you could, you will end up, uh, you know, sort of using up your your palette paper a lot more quickly. Yeah, uh, and then as opposed to like when I got it, I'm like, oh, this is bigger, or sorry, this is smaller than the, um, Masterson Stay Wet palette, right? But it wasn't bright yellow, mm. and um, I was very excited. Is about this the that. like twelve dollar one that you can get on Amazon? Yeah, I think I got it at like Michaels, at Michaels or something. Yeah. Um, but they come with like their hydration papers and then the parchment paper that you yeah. put on top. But their hydration papers are just really thick, it's like, like paper. It's like wax like, paper, or parchment paper, right? Yeah, it's it's something. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it, it, it doesn't get wet at all. So like the parchment paper that you're putting on top of it is just dry. So like yeah. the wet palette's not really doing yeah. anything. And my beef with that palette was that it, it was like crooked. It didn't sit flat on the table. Yeah. And so it would like annoyingly rock every time you'd like touch it with your brush. It would like rock over. <laughs> and then the puddle of water would like, if you had a lot of water, if you were doing a, 
a wash or something it would like run to the other side yeah it tend to Ugh. warp um the lid was very thin as the well lid too was thin, yeah. yeah and so that would warp after a while and then you know it wasn't doing what you wanted it to do which was keep your paints wet yeah um uh, several folks in chat have been asking about fan stuff, and we do have a fan stuff segment for today. So why don't we go through that while we're while we're doing our glazing? Yay! Okay, let's see what we have for this week. Zach prepared this for us before he left the studio today. Ooh. Um, this is an awesome diorama. Look at these guys. Oh, that's so cool. Um, there's a lot of cool terrain techniques <gasps> in there. That is amazing. Look at that banner. I'm, I, I don't think that was freehand, but that still looks amazing. Maybe it is freehand. That'd be. A, even better. That's a you've painted. A, well, that's a chaos night, but that's I've painted uh, an, a night. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> except that's if that's a t actually I think that's a Titan even bigger than a night. Um, these are Ridge Runners, Gene Steeler Carl vehicles. Adrian painted them with Zach uh, a few weeks ago on stream, along with a Hammerhead. Wow, look at the OSL on that that's and some, really of the, cool. some of the shading. You know what I appreciate about that? I'm going to go on a tangent here. Um, that kit is very old and there's a ton of gaps in it. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I see a, a devilfish or hammerhead painted, I always immediately look where I know the, the gaps are the worst <laughs> to see how much attention the person paid to like assembly and gap filling uh, because it can, be, it can be a little overwhelming. It can spend hours just gap filling with putty. Yeah, um, I mean, building amazing. something is is your foundation, right? Like, it's very important. It's how, it's where I nerd out, yeah. yeah. Um, I th so, okay, so we just we just wrapped around. I think that last one was a Bellacor, and those wings, the, the highlighting on those wings was amazing. I I wonder if they did glazing. Ooh. Uh, probably. <laughs> I, maybe. Yeah, let's yeah. go back and when, we, when it comes back around. Um, but there's a lot of texture in that. I just, um, I like how monochrome this is uh, or at least it's appearing like I, I like when you can see the dimension in something but you know they use the same color palette essentially where, oh yeah um you know it's a lot of browns and, and golds and whites but yep. they're in the same family but there's a lot of contrast to it yeah oh that's great okay um so this is i went when i went off on a hammerhead tangent now here we're picking up so this is uh some squigs. some squigs, yeah. Oh, I knew it. <laughs> yep, these look like some AOS models. Um, I don't know who this guy is, but he looks so dope. I That's, love the like the blood yeah, puddle some splash. vampire lord. Yeah. I think. Um, this is Bryce's. I happen to know who who painted this. This is Bryce's rat ogre. Uh, he's been working on a Skaven army, and here's that here's that Bellacor model again. Look at those wings. Oh That's my really gosh. cool. I like I like the pink and the purple in it. Um, when you get really creative with yeah. like color usage and stuff, like I was, I was talking to one of my employees the other day, he's painting up a Cthulhu model and he didn't want to just do greens and yellows. He yeah. wanted to add something else into it. And I'm like, cool, well, I have this little chibi Cthulhu in the case. <laughs> Tell me what you think of it. Cause I, I used a lot of pinks and purples in it. Um, and so that's, I like that when you can get different lighting techniques using not just the lighter color of that color and right. the darker color of that color. Yeah, that's when what you, glazing medium is. Yeah. yeah, when you tie in different colors themselves. Different colors too, right? Yeah, that's great. Okay, um, there was, I wanted to look at that Vampire Lord one more time. Uh, try, just try to figure out what, what was going on. There we go. I, is that a cape with like, oh, I can't. And it looks like the model's not quite done also. Is the right hand? No, he's just casting a spell. I need to go back and, and look at that again. Yeah, when it's not on like a slideshow. Right. That'd be really cool. Um, yeah, so ch so this is, if you want to see the, all of these pictures, these are in the Titans Discord. If you want to be part of the segment, um, the link to the Discord should be in the video description. And head over there and you can post pictures of what you're working on in one of the hobby hobby sections of the Discord. And every week we pick out a few that catch our eye and include them in the segment. And it's awesome to see what all of you guys have been working on because uh, it's huge inspiration for us. Uh, and that was, this week was great. Yeah, I, I like I loved it. Thank you, Zach, for pick, selecting them. how like helpful everyone is in the Discord and stuff. Like I, I am in it. 
Um, and I just only just recently joined not that long ago, but, um, it was really nice yeah. to see like how supportive everyone is and, and people giving advice to each other and going, Oh, is this the color that you would use and yeah. stuff? So yeah. that's really cool. That's it's, it's very helpful to have a group of people whose opinions that you trust and rely on because, you know, your eyes often lie to yourself. Um, and what you think looks like a lot of contrast because, you know, you're afraid to go that one step um, might not look like a lot of contrast to other people or to mm. your audience. And so then you go, what do you think of this? And someone goes, well, I don't really see a whole lot of dimension or contrast to it. You need to go further. And, you know, yeah. that, that group that you trust to give you good advice. Sure. You know, it, it's very helpful when you are trying to grow as a painter or as an artist in general. Yeah, constructive feedback is is great. Um, it can be hard to, especially on the internet, mm -hmm. uh, put your put your stuff out there because the internet can be a scary place sometimes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> which is which is why I like you know going into the uh, the Titans Discord channel. I was like, oh, everyone is yeah, very Titan, helpful. Titans Discord is kind of amazing in that regard. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I am I'm trying to get the, I think that the challenge, what I'm realizing is that having sort of custom mixing uh, black into my red mm -hmm. uh, while also kind of trying to keep the intensity of the, of the pigmenting correct with the glazing medium mm -hmm. is tricky because I'm basically like, I've got two variables. I'm not just like modulating the, the amount of glazing medium in the, in the paint, but mm -hmm. I'm also like, I got to get the right amount of black in with the red and then make sure that I've got the right amount of glaze. Um, this is this is harder. <laughs> and I, I understand now the value of just having a highlight color and a low light color. Yeah, I mean, and yeah, then, when it comes to mixing paints and stuff, for sure. Um, what I would suggest now then is to go in with your highlights. Because okay. if you're if you're getting really picky with like oh I'm trying to keep the same value and stuff like right. that, because um, eventually what it's going to end up doing is just all blending into each other, right. and so it shouldn't really matter. Okay. Um, and so yeah, I would just well great put that part down because it's wet. Let's and do it. Then go in with your highlights. I've got I'm gonna so I I did uh, my base coat was Word Bear's red. My highlight's going to be Mephiston red. Okay. And I'll put some of this on my palette. And then grab some glazing medium. Or no, I'm not going to grab glazing medium. I'm just going to put yeah. this straight on there. Mm -hmm. I'm also and you're noticing going in with yellow and orange, right? Yeah, uh, like a yellow and a cream color. Um, mm -hmm. I'm also noticing how small your brush is. Yeah. Uh, do you prefer the smaller brushes? Nope. Don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Tell me what I'm doing that that I should be doing. Yeah. So. I have also I have one paintbrush cat and I sort of use it until it's like used up and then I get it and then I grab another one. Okay. I have a second brush that I use for basing. Okay. And it's bigger. Okay. Okay. Should okay. I use a bigger one? Um yeah, I would I would generally my my rule is is go as big as uh as you feel comfortable. Okay. Right? But yeah, for since this you're process, not feeling comfortable at all whatsoever, just just do it. Right? Well, so for this process, um so I guess let me ask you this. What would I gain by using a larger brush with this process? So with a larger brush, um, you are holding on to a lot more moisture. Right. Um, and so when you are making those really broad strokes, your brush doesn't dry out halfway in between. And okay. so then you can then get that full pull of your color. That makes sense. Um, and instead of like doing a bunch of tiny little brush strokes and stuff, um, you're just doing one big sweep. And then that way you, um, y you know, y it blends a little bit smoother. Okay. Yeah, and I need to go back to my palette less and I'm not like um, getting the artifacts from like pulling up the brushes frequently mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. I feel like I should be going higher on this highlight. Do you agree? I'm looking at what you're doing and I... I will always agree. Yeah. Go more. Do more. Do more. Okay. Do more. All right. I'm sold. Can I borrow some of that orange? Yeah, of course. Okay. So there's this. The yellow. There's this. And then there's Actually, a scarlet red as well too. 
Yeah, I have an orange that I've been using for the edge house. Like I mentioned, the only reds I've done have been on like hard panel stuff, mm -hmm. weapons and armor plates so far. Um, I have an orange that I use for this, uh, for a high, as an edge highlight on those things. Maybe I should just grab that one. No, no. I'll just, I'll just add some of this yellow since that's what you're doing. Well, now I just finished saying how I need a single color. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna grab my, <laughs> my orange color. Yeah. Okay. BRB. Um, and at some point here, we're gonna need to uh, switch over to doing this. The uh, line. The line, yeah. yeah. But I think. And since not we, we want to do the we'll... line on both sides, um, you know, when we go back to the black side, that'll yeah. be dry, um, which we can talk about it there. Because um, at least with my model, um, the back side is a little bit easier to access. Yeah. Um, so it'll be easier for me to point out certain yeah. things. Okay, I'm gonna put my orange on here. It looks similar to your orange after you mixed red and yellow. Yeah. So I feel good about that. Sweet. Okay. Yeah, this this feels aggressive, but so do Tao not have like capes and stuff? Then is that why you were you know the most intimidated by painting them? <laughs> so they have their tactical silk, right? We talked about the tactical silk on uh -huh. the Pathfinders. There's one model that has a cape, uh, and I don't own that model. Okay. Uh, and I feel like, so the Tau at, in their lore are a very practical race, uh, and I feel like their uh, feelings on capes would echo, uh, what's the costume designer from The Incredibles? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know her name, but I know what you're talking Edna, about. Yeah. Edna Mold. Okay. I feel like the Tau's opinion on capes would be similar to Edna Mold's. They get in the way. They just get in the way. They get sucked into your jet engines, and um, yeah, and so they, they tend, I'm assuming that's why they tend not to have a lot of capes. But uh, I don't know, could be wrong. Curious what you guys think, chat. Um, but yeah, this is not something I'm familiar with. They have a lot of, like we said, a lot of cloth. Um, all their basic troops have some kind of cloth on their, on their pants in addition to the armor plates. Mm -hmm. um, they wear gloves, so they have like cloth gloves. But not like flowing. Yeah, there's not a lot of like flowing cloth. And they don't have banners either. So I feel like this technique, you know, would also apply to like flowing cloth banners. Oh, yeah, right? definitely. For sure. Um, so no banners. So yeah, this is, this is new ground. But I'm also starting a Black Templar's army. And all of that stuff, you know, there's, there's capes and banners and, and all over the place. And, yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is, yeah, this was, I, you know, I didn't really think about this aspect of the army when I, when I started it, but uh, Zach and I have both been talking about, like, how can we push ourselves in the new year in our hobby journeys mm -hmm. and taking on uh, an army that is full of this thing that is terrifying for me is... Maybe maybe a good thing. Yeah, I was maybe subconsciously that's from a Slytherin them. perspective. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Adrian pegged me as a Hufflepuff, so. Oh, have you not taken the test? Never taken the test, um, but I don't. I feel like you almost don't need to, right? You just ask people who you hang out with regularly, to to what what who who know, are familiar with the Harry Potter universe, uh -huh. to tell you what what uh, house you should be in. Um, okay. <clears throat> Uh, here we go. Yeah. Um, I've got orange. It's okay. bright. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a big jump up. Yeah. yeah. Where are you, why don't we zoom? I'll zoom in on you. Okay. And check in on where you're at. Sure. Yeah. You're waiting for stuff to dry. It looks I am like. waiting for stuff to dry. I was about to go back in with a with another round of the orange and stuff, but um, I my brush was very wet when I put it in here, yeah. and so it pulled it a little bit. Yeah. So, yeah, this is a big step of making sure that your blends are nice and smooth, um, is allowing for time, uh, allowing, allowing time for things to dry. Um, because when you go back in and you try to, like, touch wet paint, it just smudges it around. So, yeah, that's a big one. And it, with this model in particular, 
Um, I'm trying to be very careful about where I highlight because this little backpack um, actually very much gets in the way of trying to go back in with some shadows and stuff. Yeah. Um, and so I'm being very picky about where I put highlights and I'm not trying to go like super far down just as like a practical standpoint. Um, this little backpack gets in the way of my brush um, and I can go back in with like a smaller brush and stuff. But for the most part, I'm, I'm kind of similar to you in that aspect of is, I have one brush. I want to use it if I have to switch to a new brush. You know, that's like a end of the step kind of thing of, OK, right. cool, I'm going to push this brush until I can't go any further than that. <laughs> um, and I generally like a larger brush, um, a four, which is what this is, is usually too big. But when you're doing yeah. broad surfaces and stuff, um, it is large. Yeah. Yeah. I like I like it. Um, my normal brush is like a, around a, like a two or a one. I, I think this is a two. Um, I historically have been of the uh, of the persuasion to just kind of use a brush, not as, take especially good care of it, and just like, you know, I want something that performs well when it's new, and then like once it starts to degrade, just like get a new one. Uh, but I'm transitioning, and I'm like all of a sudden becoming like, oh wait, like what happens if I spend a little bit more money and invest some time into brush care, like, what is that experience like? Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so I started off. I feel like you have opinions. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I started off my, like, hobby journey with that state of mind of, like, yeah. oh, I'm going to, like, dip my toe in the water. I don't want to spend a ton of money. And, you know, if I don't like it, then I can just back out. Sure, right? yeah. But I kind of set myself up to fail that way because then I bought the cheapest brushes, I bought the cheapest paint, um, and it made my hobbying journey very frustrating to yeah, start off with to can, the point yeah. where I was like, painting's not for me, I don't like painting, oh, wow. I just like the modeling aspect, I just like being able to put stuff together and fill the gaps and be able to, you know, kit bash and be able to Oh man, to you're describing where I am today. Okay. Uh, maybe the reason I, you know, I'm not like, maybe the reason I like modeling more than painting is because I haven't, uh, discovered these proper techniques and tools yet. Yeah. And, and. Okay. Sorry. Continue. Yeah. On. No, it was, it was, yeah, it was very frustrating for me. And yeah. I was like, well, this isn't for me. I'm not having fun. Um, and this feels like a chore. So, yep. you know. Go on, go on. <laughs> Am I just describing how you're feeling about, you know? Yeah. Um, until I found a model that I really, really, really liked. And I uh, gave it to a friend to paint. And um, when I got that model back, I didn't like it. And it, it might have been something where, you know, that, that particular friend and I also had a falling out around that time as mm. well, too. So maybe it was like my feelings about that person was coming into that model as well, Man. too. Um, but, you know, I was like, well, this sucks. I really like this model. And it, I, I, I don't know what her name was, but it was a GW model. Okay. She's the, um, the vampire queen, I think. Oh. Um, and it was one of their, like, older models. She came in there, start collecting box for... Um, okay. I think the, I don't know, whatever. I'm, I'm going to put my foot in my some, mouth. Some vampire. Army, yeah. yeah. And she came on this like really cool undead looking like seahorse looking thing. Oh, wow. I bet somebody in um, chat as you're describing it. Yeah. And is gonna know what it was super it awesome. Had all these skulls on it. Yeah. And um, she had this really cool flowing cape. And so when I got it back, I was like, this is not great. And I took it to Seth. And I'm like, help me. <laughs> and he made a deal with me because he had he had heard me talking, you know, not the greatest about hobby painting for the longest time and said, I will fix this for you, but you have to learn how to paint it. And so he essentially um, it's scrubbed quite the deal. it and reprimed it for me. Yeah. And then taught me how to paint. Wow. Um, and that that's kind of where 
it started. And, and it it's, was three years ago, four years ago? About, about yeah, about three or four years ago. Yeah. yeah. So. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, that's, uh, that's where it was. And so then I got into, okay, cool. Well, what's the good stuff? What's the good brushes? What are nice brushes? And right. he introduced me to Windsor Newtons. Um, they're very expensive, right? but they're great. They're fantastic. Um, and I got to learn the difference between what a natural hair brush was versus a synthetic hair and really understand, okay, no, there is actually like a huge difference between the two. You can get really good quality synthetic brushes, mm -hmm. but once that tip starts to go, yeah, there's really yeah. not a whole lot you can do to bring it back. Sure. Um, and so with and when you say tip brushes, starts to go, it's the like the crooked. It, yeah, yeah. Right? It starts to it curl starts over. to curl over, and you can kind of take a blade to it and kind of do right. what you do with ribbons and stuff. But then you run the risk of like cutting into the hairs and stuff yeah. like that. So okay. Um, and I, so that's yeah. is that one of the things you find you get with more expensive sable brushes? Natural hair is like a longer lasting tip. Yeah, I mean your your tip can be restored. It oh, doesn't. It doesn't curl. <laughs> it doesn't curl. Wow. Like, uh, so so it, d will it curl eventually, and then you can kind of bring it back with shampoos mm, and. No, it doesn't. So it doesn't curl. What it starts to do is dry out, and oh, okay. so um, if you're finding like with this, because I'm borrowing a brush, um, so there's a lot of like paint up in the in the ferrule and stuff. Right. But the thing is, is that you can bring this back, mm. right? I'm I'm struggling a little bit with it because it's trying to it's trying to like flare out, but you can bring this back. You can clean this, you can do Got what it. you need to do. Like a good sable hair brush should and will last you your years, you know, four, like four years or oh so, gosh, if you wow. take really good care okay. of it. Yeah, it also depends on how much you paint. Um, yeah. And you know, yeah, they'll, they'll, there'll be times where you're like, okay, well this isn't getting the tip that I want yeah. or the tip that like, you know, I want for this like really precise thing, then, sure. you, then you'll buy a new brush. But you that other brush is still very usable when it comes to, you know, applying glazes, applying base coats and, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Where unlike a synthetic hair brush, cause I'm, I'm running into this as well. I bought like a really cheap pack of um, synthetic brushes to do like all my terrain painting and stuff oh, yeah. with it. And I'm finding even after just one session, the tip is starting to curl. And I'm like, okay, cool. Well, I spent pennies on this. I'm just going to throw it away. Right. But now I'm like, okay, well, I'm starting to run kind of low on it. So I don't want to keep doing that. So, yeah, even like a cheaper natural hair brush, you will find works a little bit better, will last a little bit longer than, you know, a synthetic brush because Got you it. can bring it back. Yeah. So, well, that's interesting. Yeah, there's there's a bunch of different brushes out there that would be considered good brushes. Right. Um, and we've had we've had uh, somebody a fan of the show recommend Raphael to us. Okay. Have you ever tried Raphael brushes? I've never tried them. I've heard of them. Heard of them. Um, so you know, I. In one of our very first episodes, um, he messaged me and said, "I want to send you a Raphael brush." I can't find one. Like he, he lived in the UK. He's like, I can't find one. His name is Neil. I, I can't find one like in your in the in the states that I can have shipped to you like without buying one here and like mailing Shipping it using it, yeah. UK post. Um, if you buy one, I will happily like like if you can find one locally, I'll happily like reimburse you for it. And that was like I don't know five months ago, and I've not I've not ever seen one just like in a store. Yeah. Um, but I've been meaning to to give that a try. Based on based on Neil's recommendation. Okay. Yeah, I've I've heard of them. Um, there's, uh, you know, Windsor Newton. There's Artist Opus. Um, yeah. There's all of these are names I've heard before. Yeah. There's uh, I know Monument Paints makes natural hair brushes as well too. Um, those I would consider to be like on the the cheaper end of. Uh, natural hair brushes, they're yeah. good. I like them a lot, but um, I wouldn't use them to paint like a, a lot of detail on okay. them. So, you know, you can get different quality even within the natural hair brush world and stuff. Um, there's a bunch of different other ones too. 
so I would definitely do your research if, if someone is saying that a brush is good. Yeah. But similar to what we were talking about earlier with wet palettes is, well, what do you like about it? And why do you like this one more versus something else? What, what about a natural hair brush do you like? And um, for me, a lot of people don't like the um, bounciness Ooh, of a like Windsor it's got Newton. A spring. Yeah. Yeah, they're very they're very oh. stiff. Mm. Oh, interesting. Um, and I never even thought about the springiness of a brush tip. Yeah. As like a variable that you could select for. Yeah, they um, also have a like a kind of stiffer guide hair in the center, and so some people oh, wow. um, think wow. that that gets in the way as well. So there's a bunch of different things that you can look for, um, and you know I can totally understand if you're like the kind of person who wants to just run through brushes, what's the point? But maybe give one a try. Yep. Yeah, and actually, Zach, just today, bought his first Windsor Newton brush uh, at Game Castle. I think he said he spent $25 on it. Okay. Um, I don't know which brush it was, but... It's probably uh, a Windsor. <laughs> yeah. And I think uh, I will be following suit here pretty soon. Maybe, maybe I'll look for a Raphael and uh, try out Neil's recommendation. And then Zach and I can trade off and talk about our experiences with fancy brushes one day. Um, right now, I am using uh, uh, brushes from Rose and Crown. They're a UK company that makes artist brushes. And they are, this is Sable, um, uh, but it they're like, four dollars each mm -hmm. um and so i thought i was sort of getting myself like a a nice sort of i don't know six and a half out of ten for the price of like a three and a half out of ten mm -hmm. um but uh yeah I'm, I'm thinking and they and they have they, they they work fine for me but yeah I'm, I'm interested to like see what if i spend 20 or 20 or 30 dollars on a brush what what I like or don't like about it, I'm yeah. trying that out at some point. Definitely, if you if you can, I would say try it. Um, I yeah, I learned my lesson. Um, when I when I first bought my first Windsor, I was like, this is this is so much to be spending on a paintbrush. But I trusted the advice of the person who, you know, took the time to teach me how to paint and um, helped me fix a model that I, I really liked, yeah. um, which is funny because I never actually painted that particular model. Um, I started on, I, I mean, I, I've talked about it before, but I, I started my hobby journey yeah. learning how to airbrush, and I, I learned how to airbrush on a, um, a, night, a night. And I went with a black and white theme of like, this is going to be glossy and this is going right. to be matte and I'm going to layer these. And then I got a really cool look on it, um, but I had some overspray. And when I tried to fix it, I, I wanted to throw my model across, <laughs> <laughs> across oh, yeah. the room because I uh, messed that up. And so then it was like, okay, well, now I need to learn how to use a brush. And uh, that's where the little mouse things came in. Yep. So those little those little models, um, and you, who who made who made the mouse? Was it Reaper? Yeah. Yeah. So those little guys are. I mean, they're fun for like role playing games and stuff, but they're also great as just test models for trying out new techniques or, you know, because it's small and it's not super intimidating. Yeah, and I always recommend to people who want to learn how to paint and they go, well, where do I start? My number one answer is always find a model that you really love and that you want to see painted. Because if you don't want to paint it, then you're not gonna paint it. You know what's funny is I sort of feel like the, my natural inclination is to do the opposite. I'm okay. like, oh wait, I really love this model. I have to wait to get good first before I tackle this because I don't want to mess it up. And I'll feel sad if I take this model that I love and, and, and mess it up. That's fair, I mean, I would probably, have that like mindset if it's like a one-off model of like you know it's limited edition yeah, yeah you but know, none whatever. of this stuff's like that right yeah but the reapers were you know like they're, they're like five bucks for like right, two exactly, little mouse yeah. things um and so 
I I love them. I wanted to see them painted. I wanted to see what I could do with it. And yeah. because I loved it and because I thought they were so cute, I wanted to do my best. And so I really pushed myself yeah. to then do techniques that I was afraid of. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, I am just about at a stopping point with my red highlights okay. because... I'm starting to run into the problem we ran into on the on the other side where it's wet. It's wet. Yeah. Um, so we could either go back to the the black side of the cape, or maybe we could start working on our on our stripe. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I would say definitely. Let's work on our stripe. Um, okay. Um, do you want to show where you're at, and then I can show where I'm at sure. uh, before we transition. I wish the backpack wasn't there, but um, yeah, you know, was that backpack? That's a, that's part of that bit, right? Yeah, yeah, it it well, okay, so it glues on like right yeah. there, but um, I was like, I need something to hold on. Yeah, to, it's a nice but, handle yeah. for you. Yeah. Um, okay, and here's where I'm at. Uh, yeah, so yeah. I just kind of highlighted. What do you think about that? Uh, I think your highlights are too strong. Too strong? Yeah. What? Um, All of my fears have been realized. <laughs> it's Abort. not It's not that. I think you, you need to blend them a little bit okay. more. Okay. Yeah. Um, you need to do some more like glazing on the edges and stuff and, and work them in a little bit more because right now they're very stark and yeah. they stick out a lot. Yeah. Um, so if you just do some glazing and stuff, but your recess right in here. Yeah. I like that. I okay. like that a lot. And very I hope great. you do too. Um, because it's very nicely blended between this red over here yeah. and then the black that comes in through the cape, which is actually really cool because the back side of the cape is black. So yeah. it makes it almost look almost like a like a thin red veil over sure. the black. Oh, yeah, okay. Or almost we can like imagine color it. changing kind of. Yeah. Maybe it's two pieces of fabric, a black piece of... It probably is, right? It's a black, probably a black piece of fabric on one side and a red si piece of fabric on the other side, and they're sewn together. Yeah. Okay, let's do some stripes. Thank you. Sweet. So on the black side, you wanted to do a red stripe. Oh no, yeah. I some paint. Yeah, so what I want to do on these is basically on along the bottom fringe of the cape, on the red side of the cape, I want to do a black stripe along the bottom. And on the black side of the cape, I want to do a red stripe along the bottom. Yep. So which one should we start with? Uh, let's start with the dry side. The dry side, the right. Cape good, first. Good and I've got red paint already out. Yep. So am I going to use, which color red am I going to use? My base coat color? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, so you're actually on, yeah. going to go in with a very opaque line. And so this no is glazing going, medium, yeah, just no. straight paint. Okay. This is going to be the scariest part of this, right? All right, scariest part first. Here we go. So the thing that you want to keep in mind when you are drawing on a folded surface like this yeah. is where you start your line, that is the distance that you are going to keep from the edge of this yeah. all the way through. So this right here is what you are going to keep in mind. Doesn't matter whatever the, what the rest of the cape is, right? So if you are scared and you go, okay, cool, well, where do I put my line when I get to this folded edge? Well, how far away is it yeah. from the edge? And this is the easiest part of like freehanding is just drawing in like a straight line when you get into like little folds and stuff. Cause then all you have to do is just remember, well, how far away am I from this? And I actually saw this um, kind of cute uh, post I was just on the internet of like oh this is how my you know grandma taught me how to sew like a uh, like a hem on something yeah. and someone had drawn two lines on their thumb and that that first line is that's the edge of your thing and this is where you want to sew yeah and so that's something that you want to keep in mind yeah um yeah, no, that's great. And I can sort of create a mental note of that distance. Yep. And then just kind of maintain it throughout the um, throughout as I'm painting this line across the across the bottom of this cape. 
Okay, it's paint straight out of the bottle. Here we go. Super opaque. And some distance away from the bottom of of my cape. Yeah, so you just pick a you pick where you th like okay, this would be a cool line. And then you just go. Yep. And then how wide are you doing your line? Uh pretty wide because you're going to be putting in highlights and uh, shadows in this line as well too oh to gosh. match the uh, look and feel of your cape. And so you want to give yourself enough room Am to- Am I, Cat? Uh, Am I? <laughs> you should. You should. You want right. to give yourself enough room to be able to work with it, right? Okay. I'm holding my breath. That is totally fine. Um, normally in order to do stuff like this, because I, I, I see a lot better up close without my glasses, I would do that. But I'm going to try and keep it in frame as much as possible. So let's see if I can do this. Um, and you really want a sharp tip to your brush. Yeah. So I'm going to be painting on my thumbnail and rolling my brush tip so that I get that sharp, sharp edge. Man, this is hard. Yeah, it's uh, I'm concentrating hard, guys. <laughs> trying my best. We're okay. gonna try and keep this entertaining, but also, <laughs> but also, this is really hard. <laughs> it's very easy when you breathe to go. Oh no, I messed that up. So. Yeah. Um. I feel like this would be a good time for some acrylic retarder on, in my paint, if not. Uh, so you don't have to like continuously dip your brush yeah, and stuff? Yeah. I want to I want to load up my paint with a lot of, or uh, yeah, so I don't have to go back as often. Sure, yeah. I mean, if, if you feel like that would help you, then uh, definitely. Okay. And you can, you know, you don't have to be like, okay, cool, I'm going to paint this, right? I'm yeah. painting in a kind of sketched in um, guiding line, right? Because then when I go back in, this is also often how I do eyeliner, right? As I'm painting a really thin line, I'm just kind of pressing it one by wow. one. I'm not trying to, like, get it all in one stroke. Never um, thought about it that way. So, yeah. Definitely some carryover on techniques between miniature painting and, and uh, makeup application. Oh, I mean, not, not even just an application. It's also products as well, too. Because um, oftentimes you'll find that, I mean, if, if when you start to pay attention to it or if you, or if you are in both worlds of yep. um, makeup and miniature painting, is that's one of the first tie-ins that I made of like oh this is a makeup tool that's really funny um i can buy this for a dollar uh you know a makeup beauty supply rather than ten dollars a hobby specific it's, product it's yeah. hobby specific yeah. yeah that's funny yeah, i feel like that's half of sort of tool selection is knowing all the all the inexpensive hacks like knowing that like hey i can get this at this store, because it's like also used in this other industry, as soon as something gets picked up as a hobby product, it's like, uh, uh, you know, they can charge a 200% markup. Oh yeah. Because it's a hobby product. I mean. Um, I'm talking to the manager of several regional <laughs> hobby yeah. stores, yes. but uh, what, are your <laughs> what are your thoughts on this cat? <laughs> I mean, that, that's a lot of it as well too. I mean, sometimes too is, is some, it, it goes both ways, right? Of, you know, because it's labeled as hobby and niche, then it's cheap and you know, whatever. And once you put like a brand name on it that isn't Games Workshop or, you know, yeah. something, then it starts to become expensive because you can get really expensive makeup brushes. You can get really expensive makeup sponges. Um, you can also get really expensive, you know, artist brushes and you can get really expensive blending, um, weathering sponges, what they're called in the hobby world. They're just makeup sponges. 
um, if you go to CVS or, you know, a Weathering drug store. Weathering sponges, yeah. Yeah, you can uh, get the exact same thing uh, for, you know, a dollar or whatever. But super glue um, and stuff, sometimes it's worth paying that extra amount when it comes to, you know, the hobby brand or whatever, because you know you're getting quality stuff. A lot of questions that I get are like, well, why can't I just use you know, this acrylic paint that I, like a craft store paint. Yep. And, you know, my answer there is you can. You can. It's just not going to be as smooth as it would be if you used modeling paint. Don't tell that to Adrian. He runs craft store paint through his airbrush and tells us every day how amazing it is. He's like, favorite paint color is Vallejo Blue Green. His second favorite paint color is this, like, six ounce bottle of, like, craft store, <laughs> craft store paint. <laughs> Uh, this like tan brown color. Um, through an airbrush. Through an airbrush, yeah. This poor airbrush. Yep. I know, right? Uh, I don't know. To each his or her own. Yeah, to each their own. Um, but you know, it. You can. That the, the thing is, is that you can. You can be as cheap about it as possible if you know the right techniques. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, all these painters and stuff where you take away their tools, they can still come up with something pretty cool. Um, Actually, I take that back. He does not run that color through his airbrush. Oh, okay. Uh, I was misremembering this conversation. He loves the color and he loves applying it, but he can't apply it through an airbrush. So he often has to like, he was telling me he has to go back and forth between uh, I see. brushing and airbrushing. Like where normally he might just like, brush this color on he has to stop and brush paint it and then go on to his next airbrush color after because we were talking about how like oh I'll often do all the airbrushing at the start and then sort of move on to to brush painting afterwards and he's like well except I have this one color that I really love that I have to brush paint on because it doesn't <laughs> run through my airbrush very well okay how's your line coming along I feel like it's coming along great um, uh, I'm so it's interesting. I started out doing it really thin, mm -hmm. and then it wasn't quite straight. Like it, the the the, uh, the distance from the from the bottom of the of the cape was not super consistent. Mm -hmm. But because I started really thin, I was and 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 it was thinner than I ultimately wanted it to be. Uh -huh. I could sort of add thickness on the side of the line. Like if I needed it to be a little higher because I was too close to the bottom of the cape edge, I would just add thickness on the top of the line, yep. essentially. So now I'm going back and like adding thickness strategically to the side of the line to sort of fix my earlier uh, placement errors with the center of the line, if that makes sense. No, yeah, that makes complete sense. Um, and that's also sometimes uh, the mistake that people make when applying eyeliner is like, oh, I can fix this by making it thicker. You can never fix it by making it thicker. Just take it off. Oh, um, <laughs> well. But um, when it comes to painting and stuff, it's a little bit different, right? So yeah, you can, uh, <laughs> you can do that. Um, it's just something that's like, okay, it starts to look messy when you make well, it too thick. Well, right? I intentionally started out applying the line too thin because I, this was like part of my strategy. Yeah, and also, I mean, like if you really mess up, you can just completely paint the bottom part of your cape that color, right? Like, you know, oh, and sure. then what you're what you're then trying to match is is the height of it. Yep. Perfect, right? And yep. so like You've you only got one side going. of the line. Yeah. yeah. Okay, can I show this? Yeah. To you? Right, it looks here. awesome, even from here. We've got a red line. Yay. Cool. So how'd that, that look, feel? That look that felt great. I can do this part. Yeah. Uh, I feel good about this. Um, the blending of it is going to be interesting. <laughs> um, maybe we won't quite get there today. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, but it's it's essentially the same thing of what we did before. Yeah. It's just instead of like doing broad strokes, you're just touching. Yeah, and so I'm it. essentially trying to highlight in the same areas. 
that in, you highlighted at low the rest light of the cave. in mm -hmm. the same areas as uh, the rest of the cave, just with the orange on the red line mm -hmm. instead of with the light gray mm -hmm. on the Which on is the really black. cool because, you know, we did red and then we did black. And so if you're going to do a red yep. line, you essentially just use the same colors that you use to highlight your red cape. And then you're going to do a black line on this side. Yeah. And so then, you know, that's pretty easy. Um, you have all the colors, you have the techniques down, you see how they apply as a, as a, in a broader sense. Yeah. But then when you go to do it, you know, in a, in a more micro sense of just your line, you know exactly where to apply those, right. those colors. Yeah. Okay. Shell, are you, are you done with your red? Or do you have uh, yeah. another coat to do to get it a little more opaque? Um, I mean, I got it down pretty much because okay. um, this isn't amazing. this isn't the it. color of red that I would want it to be. Yeah. I would want it to be a little bit lighter. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I have my baseline down. Um, and with this one, because the folds are so stark, yeah. I can go really high with yeah. my highlights and stuff. And you can do that with this as well, too. Yeah, it's interesting. The two capes, even though they are both sort of on the surface, like big flowy capes, mm -hmm. they're actually, once you once you get into it, they're actually quite different. Mm -hmm. Like your cape has a lot more sharp, small creases, uh, whereas mine are sort of more big, gradual flows. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, shall, we, shall we flip it over and do the black line on the red side? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to close this guy up. And then... So I'm going to go in with gray yep. on this one. Yep. Because, yeah, um, I do the same. don't want it to be black because I'm yeah. trying to highlight that, you know, you, then you just want to, you're, you're just putting in your shadows and, yeah. and a little bit of highlights instead, which might be a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to match the height that this one there. is. Um, and so to match the height of this, I'm just going to then go and on the side here, paint this gray and that's my starting line. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, cause we've got uh, something yeah. to match now. We don't want it to be too different, right? Yeah. And I guess this is kind of where it gets a little bit more, uh, Nerve wracking because yeah. then you're trying to match, right? Because this yeah. one you had a little bit more freedom on. Yeah. But this one it's like, okay, well, I'm trying to match. But at, at the end of the day, because they're not next to each other. You yeah, know, they're on two different sides of the thing, which you, yeah. it would be really hard to look at both sides at the same time of the cape. Although yours, it's maybe a little easier to do. Yeah. Because the, the cape's kind of flipped up like that. Um, and then on this other side over here as well, too. Oh, I got it some gray here. Um, I'm going to do the same thing. So that way I know when I meet this line. Oh yeah. That it matches up here. You've got something to aim for. Yeah. That's a good, that's good advice. I got halfway through this and I realized, you know what? I don't know where I'm shooting for. <laughs> I need to, yeah. Let me paint this gray line on the other side. So I've got a target. You know, so when we flipped this over and went back over to the black side of the cape, mm. the red side was not quite dry yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was hard, like the, like you were saying, the mat or the, um, the glaze medium has a little more of a satin finish than these paints do. Yeah. And so now that they're dry, I'm actually like, man, super happy with how the red highlights came out you you said i should bring them down a little bit from with adding some more uh i mean it's up to you yeah. i would just blend them in a little yeah, bit blend them yeah blend them in a little more yeah they're a bit more stark but um you know I, if you're happy with it then that's really at the end of the day that's yeah what that's about okay that is the most important thing okay uh I'm making my way across here with a gray line. For some reason, I think just because of the orientation of this cape and the direction of the curves, um, this is like, I'm finding this is harder this Oh, because you're going in more. Yeah, uh, versus exactly. Versus the other side, yeah. Yeah, I feel like this is, 
is harder than the other. Yeah, and this is where, you know, having a really sharp tip to your brush really comes in handy as well, too. Um, I've seen other people do it where, you know, they lay their brush super flat um, and they really spread it out like this. Um, yeah. So that way you have this kind of flat edge to it and then you can go in and then lay that really flat edge. To me though, it's a little bit more nerve wracking because you're covering more. Yeah, yeah. Um, to our point earlier, you can't sort of tweak it yeah. to one and side so or the other. It just kind of depends on what you want to do. Um, whatever you're comfortable with, if you like that big flat edge and that helps you line up, um, then I say go for it. But to me, I just like taking it like one little dot at a time and yeah. just kind of sketch it in. And then when I'm comfortable with that line, then I'll go in and, and make those broader strokes. Yep, I agree. I like to sort of sketch it in, like you said, sketch it in, see how it feels. Oh, do I need to tweak it a little bit up, a little bit down? And then come back and make those adjustments. Yeah, because like also having the starting edge on this side here, I was starting to dip a little bit low and I thought that that was the top of my line yep. when it actually perfectly met the bottom of my line. Um, and so that oh, helped shoot. a lot. Oh, did that work out? Yeah, because um, I, was, I was going very thin and sketching it in and so that helped immensely. Um, one other good thing that this is, this technique in particular is very helpful f with is painting in checker patterns, which I know is a big thing with like the Harlequins and yeah. stuff. Um, and so once you know how to paint a straight line, relatively speaking, when it comes to like the actual model and stuff, then you know, okay, cool. Well, this is how I stay with the, um, right. The, the folds and the you know curves of the model to make this line appear straight. Yeah, Harlequins have a lot of flowy cloths. And man, can you imagine trying to paint a checker pattern on this cape? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I... That would be some next level challenge. I mean, I know a lot of people do like really intense, um, like, you know, that banner that we saw earlier. Right. Um, you yeah, know, here's a free full hand. freehand thing on on a curvy surface with gradients. <laughs> yeah, that's like kind of the next thing that I want to really push myself with. Um, I have this really cool night model, um, and the horse has I don't even know what it would be called, but it has like that cloth over the back of oh, it, yeah. where typically you would find really detailed, delicate filigree patterns and sorry when you say knight you mean mounted human yeah, with armor human, on a horse yeah, yes. rather than a 30 story tall robot yes okay cool yeah just want to clarify yes a uh um i think it's a galahad model specifically oh, okay. so like very a pretty of the round table a very pretty knight who deserves all the regalness in the world um and that to me is very intimidating right now is painting freehand stuff it's yeah man it's hard i feel like the sort of classic shortcut with harlequins if you wanted to do a checkerboard pattern on cloth is with decals or with uh, like stencil masks mm -hmm. like vinyl you can get we have some vinyl um, <clears throat> material and you can cut it out or you can get like a vinyl cutter or some kind of computer controlled piece of equipment and mm -hmm. like cut out a pattern or a laser, cut out a pattern and then peel it off and adhere it to your, like as closely as possible, match the mask to the piece of cloth and then do your airbrush. Um, but yeah, man, doing some kind of freehand uh, checkerboard pattern with a, uh, some kind of a fade on top of it without an airbrush that just feels crazy to me 
Yeah, but because it seems intimidating to me, yeah. I want to do it. You so. want to do it because you're Slytherin. We talked yes. about this. All right. Uh, I feel good about this. Um, how are you doing? Can I zoom uh, in on you? Yeah, go okay. for it. Okay. Uh, that looks great. Yeah, I like it. What do you think? I like it. Yeah, and then it, it comes down to, okay, cool. So this these really broad strokes and this really fine gradient that we have on the side, which to me it's a little too light, so I'm going to go back in and do a little bit more. Right. Um, but, yeah, just do that in a much, much smaller, tinier fashion. And it's really you just touching your brush to certain things um, rather than doing, like, the long, broad strokes. Right. I, I think uh, I see, so when when we first started talking about this, I was kind of poo-pooing the idea of uh, applying the same highlights and lowlights to the line as the as the rest of the, as we did earlier with the rest of the cape. Mm -hmm. But I, I totally get it now. Looking at this, sorry, I'll, I'll pass you mine. Um, looking at this now, I'm like, wow, that cloak looks amazing and those highlights look amazing and then the line almost just kind of kills it for me. Yeah. And I really want the the line to be highlighted as well. Uh, so why don't we do, what, how about this? It's, we're two hours, a little over two hours in. Mm -hmm. um, could we do one side, like highlight one of the sides? Yeah. Which, and then, and then call it, call it done? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, which side, which side should we do? The why don't we do the outside? Okay. So what is the red and then with the black line? Does that, does that feel good? Sure. Okay. Um, and then, and then, yeah, and then we'll, that'll be a good stopping point for us. So I'm going to go ahead and grab, we want to do the low lights first. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I'll grab some more glazing medium, not white. Grab some more glazing medium and do uh, some black down in the recesses, in the recesses mm -hmm. of this. And yeah, you're yeah. just going to be touching, essentially. And what are you doing with your thing, thumbnail there? Oh, I'm just forming my brush. Um, oh, I see. Very similar to what I would do on my wet palette, but um, I have a stray hair that keeps wanting to poke out. Oh, no. <laughs> Stray hair. Okay, so I'm just doing, here, I'm gonna zoom in on you. I'm just doing the low lights, the, the like sort of shadowed section of the line. Mm -hmm. I'm painting over the line that we already painted with glazed black paint. This is kind of intense also. We're, we're at the stage of the project where like the consequences of messing up, like sort of keep getting higher and higher. Yeah. Um, and the, the consequences at this stage are quite high. Uh, like fixing it would be a lot of work or painting over it and starting over would, would, would mean a lot of lost time. This is, this is what my brain tells me as I, as I engage with more advanced techniques like this. I'm like, you could do that, but, but if, if you, you mess, mess up, up <laughs> let's, let's, let's revisit in your head all the, all the work you've put into this to get to this point. Right. Don't mess up. And that's, I think that's kind of like the worst thing of, you know, painting, right? You, you start to get to in your head about, like, your well, head, don't, yeah. don't mess up, don't mess up, don't mess up. And it's like, well, I got my model to this point, right? Like I am capable of fixing it. And I mean, yeah, you're right. Like, it, oh, it's a time thing, but um, you're learning a new technique and- Sure. You know, it yeah. comes down to a certain point where it, I don't know, it, it's almost kind of worth it to mess up to me. Um, For that learning, yeah. Yeah. 
That's really insightful, yeah. We talked about that a little bit before. Like, if you <clears throat> instead view it as a learning opportunity instead of as, oh, man, if I don't do this right, I'll be back. I'll have just, my, the last three hours will have just <clears throat> been wasted. Been waste, yeah. yeah. Then kind of changes your paradigm on, on how it, what, what your definition of success or failure is. Yeah, yeah. And, and to me, I learned something. I'm going to consider that a success. Yep. Okay, I did my low lights. Now I'm going to go ahead and put some light gray on the parts of the line where I have some orange highlights on the cape. All right, let's see. I'm going to zoom in on myself and see what I'm working on. Uh, this light gray, the I think the highlight part is the is the scariest part for me still. It definitely feels um, like you know it's worth it's where the decision making is like where do I put the where would the light hit it and like where would the and like how much of it should, of this should I do and that yeah. kind of thing. And with with this though, um, you know, you're just putting like little dots, right? Like, and if you don't like it, you can just glaze back over it. Right. Sure. Yeah. This is a really, and you're still using the same brush, right? You're not yep. even with this sort of super fine detail level of work. You're still using your number four. Mm hmm. Yeah. This is where having, you know, kind of almost doesn't matter. I mean, it does matter, but like, if you have a brush with a a nice fine tip you can use a pretty big brush for a lot of your work and it just kind of works fine yeah I find that really the only time that like I don't want a big brush is when it just physically cannot fit into the space that I'm painting that's a good that's a good uh, decision criteria because I was wondering about that like when would you decide actually to use, if you have a, a, a big brush with a nice fine tip, like when would you decide to use a small brush ever? It sounds like if you're doing something where there's sort of space constraints around access, right? Yeah. And for the most part, that, that's pretty much the only time where I'm like, okay, cool, uh, I'll switch. Or I need a bigger brush or, or sorry, a smaller brush. Yeah. Um, where I'm finding that just I'm using my tip too much and I want to be able to lay my brush down a little bit to be able to get the broader strokes of it. Yeah. Um, that's good. Yeah, that's a good way of thinking about it. I like that. All right, now I'm going to, I've got my... Uh, Got my highlight color down. I'm going to go back with the glaze medium, and then and glaze up the dark gray, the dark gray back onto the highlight. That's good. That's good. See, you're already getting to the point where you're like, okay, I know what I need to do next. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm just to, kind of I doing go the back. inverse yeah. of this, uh, what we did on the on the other side. Yeah, you should feel confident enough in you know, what you've learned to be able to then go, okay, well, you know, this is what I need to do next. Yeah, I've kind of got to hang for what the next step is. Um, and yeah, like I said before, this process, once I've sort of, once you've kind of explained it to me, mm -hmm. uh, and we've now gone through it together one time, I feel super positive on this. Like this is uh, a great technique and it's, for me, I think the most of what made it scary was not understanding the theory. Yeah. And now that now that we kind of get a wrap, now that I've kind of wrapped my head around how it works and what's supposed to happen, like the execution portion of it, it's time consuming, um, but the results kind of speak for themselves. I'm super happy with how it's coming out. And that's great. That's great. That's you know that's generally why you know you want to you know, take classes or, you know, watch YouTube tutorials and stuff of, 
I want to know this technique and you know I find that most people who say that something is intimidating it's just because they don't know how to do it yeah sure uh, okay and how are you doing um, it's a little hard to see from so far away right but I think it's it's okay it's okay it's a little rough but it's okay I can always go back in and fix it when I can, like, see, see you, a little bit better. When you can put on your magnifying glasses? Yeah, when I can, you know, get my face get in there. Get your face in there without blocking the camera? Yeah. yeah. I think that's... It's a challenge with the, with the live stream setup, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's not bad. Um, if I had better eyes, I think it would be fine. <laughs> but, you know, I have glasses for a reason. But how are you feeling? I mean. Good. Uh, I, I realized like I overglazed just a little bit. And so I'm going back with light gray now. Mm -hmm. um, and trying to add a f little, undo a little bit of what I did with the, uh, with the glaze. Yeah. It's um, a lot of uh, push and pull. Yeah. Just to try to match the sort of level of brightness of the highlight that I have on some of these areas. Yeah. Uh, and that's, I think, again, we were talking about before having something to match on this side of the cape. Like, I feel like I've got, um, I've got something to match here that I need to make sure I'm keeping in my mind as I'm, as I'm putting this color down. I'm not just looking for a gradient. I'm looking for a specific gradient. Um, that I didn't have to worry about when, when we first started this. Yeah, and because you're you're doing the same colors, you can always just flip back over and see. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know what the other side of your cape looks like. Sadie's coming to say hi. Sadie's in the studio today. <laughs> she, uh, I think, is ready for dinner. Yeah, maybe <laughs> she's coming out soon. Or something. Yeah, she's been down here the whole time. That's right. She's been sleeping under the table. All right, uh, I think I think I'm good. Okay. Um, I think I'm good with with the um, yeah with the stripe. Uh, can I give you this to to show you? Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. There we go. Um, that's a, that looks awesome. So yeah, it, it it's subtle on the stripe, but I I feel like it comes through. You can see it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. It comes through. And again, like last time I looked at this, it was uh, the the glaze on the on the highlight was still was still wet. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like as it dried, like we talked about before, it kind of like smooths everything out. It looks a mm -hmm. lot better after it dries. Um, so I'm super happy with that. And, and again, if you're not sure, up. you can always matte varnish back on top right. of it, right? If you want it to be matte um, yeah. at the end of it, because it, it, it's will. still a little bit satin, yep. right? Yep. Um, yep. Then when you matte varnish back on top of it, it almost, again, going back into like makeup talk, it's almost like setting spray for your makeup. It kind of yeah. blends everything in. Right. Um, it smooths everything out. Um, you can see a little bit more rather than, you know, being faced with the right. major like glare and it's stuff. it's kind of magical i'm 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 quite pleased with the product i'm quite pleased with the i like for my first i was i had very low expectations for my first times out first time out with this uh technique and mm -hmm. with, with this product um with glazing medium in general um so i'm, I'm pretty happy with how it came out i'm, I'm excited to like so i've got the rest of the model here uh stick this cape on the guy and um Maybe we can, I don't know, snap fit them together and see if we can show off kind of the direction we're going for here. Yeah, and I mean, now that you know, like, the glazing techniques and stuff, yeah. um, you can paint his tabard. Yeah, I'm going to do the, I'm going to do the tabard in the same, oh, this is kind of crazy. Okay, let me put him on the <laughs> glam cam. Because um, you just did a, uh, you just did a single cape and you don't have the model, so... Well, we can we can put we can put yours on here too. I think. Um, yeah. Can we see him? 
Try fit focus. This. Let's try a focus. No, not working out. We can do it. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so this is his front and his back. So we'll do the tabard is not no work's been done on the tabard yet. So we'll have to have to add some some work there too. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of where I'm at. Um, Kat, let me grab your cape. Oh, and you you put you put the cape on the model. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Uh, uh, oh, she doesn't have base. No base. Oh no. But we can we can lean her against. Okay. Um, your diorama here. Focus. I'll put Sadie on the glam cam. That looks amazing. <laughs> the the I love the glazing on this side of the cape. Uh, the light gray to dark gray specifically. It's wonderful. Okay, I'm gonna spin it around, and we'll see the uh, the the red side of the cape. Oh no. Oh no. It's fine. <laughs> uh, I can fix it. I can fix it. Because it's just press fit in there, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to do the cape. All right. Oh, no. <laughs> this is, uh... There we go. Okay, so that's just the cape. Okay. So this is where we ended up. We have... Uh, we, walked through the, we walked through the process of a red cape with a black sort of interior and a stripe on the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, we learned about uh, starting with the base color, glazing down into the recesses, highlighting and then glazing back onto the raised edges. Um, we walked through putting a line uh, along the, the base of the cape yep. and uh, matching sort of the, uh, the blending of the cape onto the line. All of this was very intimidating, but Kat, you made it very approachable. Awesome. And we, we took, took it through in a step-by-step -step way. Um, do you have anything you want to share about uh, anything, really? <laughs> um, I mean, like, what... I will keep saying and keep harping on is is if anything is intimidating, yeah. it's simply just because you don't know how to do it. Yeah. Um, and like you won't learn how to do it until you actually do it. Um, and so, you know, you can watch a bunch of tutorials, you can watch a bunch of people do like things, but you try it out yourself and you'll find that it's not so bad. Yeah. At the end of it. Yeah. It ends up it ends up uh you know the hardest the hardest the hardest part of it is just that first step yeah. yeah i absolutely agree this was terrifying for me before the show when we were getting ready and it was it was a lot of fun and we ended up with uh some things that i'm super excited to to keep progressing on and i'm definitely going to revisit this uh, pathfinder like um uh, matt baker was asking about earlier we'll, yeah. <laughs> we'll try him with the, the same technique yeah Sweet. his tactical silk um, so upcoming on, on Hobby Titans, uh, this week on Friday, Zach and, Ape, and uh, Adrian are going to be uh, giving us a bonus stream this week. They're going to be painting Dragons and Kragnos. Uh, it's going to start at noontime uh, Pacific. And yeah, if you saw, we have a, just kind of a casual Kragnos in the back here. <laughs> uh, that's uh, just off stream. Zach's been... Uh, working on the base, getting that primed up and built. Uh, Adrian's been working on his dragon. Uh, and then we're going to play those in a game uh, coming up over on our sister channel, Tabletop Titans, if you want to. I'm sure they'll, they'll talk about the whens and hows and whats uh, of that this week on Friday. And then next week, also Zach and Adrian are going to be painting the new... Um, the new box set, uh, Custodes, Custodes and Gene Stealer Cult. That's coming out that, um, soon. I think it's coming out this weekend. Uh, so that's coming up on Hobby Titans. Um, we'll, uh, as we like to say around here, everyone, uh, 
Uh, be kind to yourselves, be kind to each other, and always be creating. We'll see you on Friday. Bye. Bye.